Okay, then uh, at least on my computer, it's shown that it's 10 o'clock sharp. And as mentioned before, we have a tight schedule ahead. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final conference of the Helcom Blues project. Uh, my name is Jana Wolf, and I'm the Helcom Blues project coordinator. And it's my great pleasure to see you here at this final event of the project. Um, before we start with the official program, I would like to brief you on a couple of important things. As already mentioned from Johanna, please know that this conference is being recorded and with your participation, you give us consent to this recording being done. And uh, secondly, uh, due to the geopolitical situation, Helcom is currently in a strategic pause. And official meetings of all HELCOM working and expert groups and other subsidiary bodies are suspended until further notice. Only informal consultation sessions without Russian participation can be organized and hosted by a contracting party. And accordingly, Latvia has kindly agreed to host this informal consultation session for the HELCOM Blues project to enable the discussion on the achieved deliverables and further use of the results. And with this, I would like to give the floor now officially to our moderator of today's events, Otilia, please. Thank you so much, Jana, and warm welcome to everyone to this Helcom Blues final conference. Uh, it's really a pleasure that I will be moderating today, leading you through four main thematic areas of this project, which is a joint effort by prominent scientists around the region to improve the monitoring the methodologies as well as assessment to develop in the endpoint really indicators to be used for larger regional environmental processes related to Helcom, but also to the European Union. So uh, as Jana was sort of alluding to, this is an informal consultation session of the Helcom Blues project. And uh, today is really about finding out the results from all these different thematic areas uh, we have biodiversity, marine litter, underwater noise, as well as efficiency and measures. And really all these results are to underpin the implementation of the updated Baltic Sea Action Plan to provide really the monitoring data and guidance that can be used in connection to the development of the third holistic assessment of the Baltic Sea, better known as the HOLAS-3, but also importantly for EU processes, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the MSFD, in achieving good environmental status of European waters. So many of you are most likely uh, very you know, familiar with blues, but just for those who maybe are joining in and this is new, this is really a abbreviation, the word blues, which is very um, snappy, uh, meaning essentially the thematic areas that the results have been in. So biodiversity, litter, as I said, underwater noise and effective regional measures for the Baltic Sea. This has been a two year venture co-funded with the European Union and led by Helcom. And this is truly a Baltic wide effort and has just finalized uh, the project now end of 2022. So, as I said, this project really aims to attain the good environmental status for the Baltic Sea and really to support the development of both new as well as regionally coordinated measures that can really address the pressures that the Baltic Sea are facing and really improve the monitoring assessments that are done specifically for this region. There has been about 14 partners and seven subcontractors in various backgrounds of policy, research, academia, civil society who have been involved in this project. My name is Atelia Torsen, and I've been involved in the Baltic Sea region for over a decade, both in processes within Helcom, but wider, been an observer to the Helcom heads of delegation, as well as led different initiatives, trying to engage different actors to mobilize change for the marine environment, but also raising views on the critical advancement of the member states in meeting the commitments of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So I am especially looking forward to learning about these new monitoring techniques in these areas that have been quite difficult to set up in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, specifically biodiversity and underwater noise, and also the challenges of trying to meet the Baltic Sea Action Plan. 
But also, I think it's important to allude that in the light of the renewed roadmap for the Convention of the um, Biological Diversity, where there's a roadmap, roadmap now set for 2030, which looks to see how do we put targets to reduce the threats of biodiversity, both inland, coastal, and marine ecosystems, as well as the ongoing negotiations that are going on at the moment to set up an internationally legally binding instrument for plastic pollution which includes the marine environment. So I think this is such a timely conference to come with these results that are both important for the region, important for the European Union, but also internationally. We have roughly 95 registered participants today that are covering all Baltic Sea countries apart from Russia, as well as representatives from the European Union. We had asked all of you when you registered to fill in a questionnaire that wasn't so keen by many of you, so we haven't got a very um, substantial sort of answers to give, so we thought we would not let you off the hook, uh, but actually do a little Slido exercise to warm us up, get us into this conference mood. Um, and, and see who is actually listening in today. So if I ask uh, Johanna to maybe set up our first Slido, and if you could bring out your mobiles or um, take a picture, you will see soon a image with a QR code on Slido where we will be asking you the question, here we go, of in one word, can you just type to us in the Slido, what is the mood that you are in today? So you have the QR code there, or you have the Slido number if you go to that website, slido.com. We'll be using this a few times during the day just to get some interaction and engage to hear you as participants, what you are thinking. Uh, this is a very packed day, um, so this is one way for us to also get some engagement. So please uh, fill in just one word or two words, whatever you're feeling today. Curious. Yes, I think we all are very curious about the results today. Good that people are calm and happy. That's a good attitude to have going into this conference today. We will hopefully find some inspiration with the results coming. Many people are interested. Excellent. So coffee mode. Yes, I can assure you that we will have a few coffee breaks today. We are making sure that there's some good sort of breaks. Uh, this is a long day with a lot of information. So we will have that involved as well as Johanna will bring us into some stretches. So um, post vacation. Yes, I can imagine for some of you, maybe this is the first conference or maybe it's the fourth. Who knows? Um, so Either you are still a little bit sleepy and hopefully we will get through this day with a lot of um, interest um, and the results. So I see there's still a few people typing, but um, I think we have a nice sort of uh, general um, setup here. People are interested, curious. This is really where we want to go. Uh, we hope we can meet that today. And so we have uh, one more Slido question. Um, which is maybe a little bit more of understanding who is actually joining us today. Um, so we will have a slider question here about what, which sector do you represent? So just to get an idea of who is joining in and uh, coming with different perspectives that hopefully will also allude to some of the questions coming today. So Johanna, I'm hoping that you are... Yes, coming with the Slido. So same thing again, uh, the QR code, and um, you should already be in there. So this should just be the second question on your mobile. So if you could just fill in which sector you are representing. And Johanna, I don't know if there is uh, on the screen, if we can see more than just those sectors on the slide. So we have those four sectors. No, we have more. Okay, other is okay. So it looks like the winner is science, which is not so strange. We have a lot of um, science in institutions uh, that are joining us today. And then we have policy and management. Thank you, Johanna. So actually, I did want to just allude back to this questionnaire, although we got very few uh, respondents, but it was really interesting to see that the main interest actually was underwater noise. And I think that could also be because this is a sort of bringing, uh, 
a new area, I would say, in a sense, that has been slowly, you know, expanding in research. We're learning more and more about underwater noise. Um, so I think this is sort of uh, an interesting area that, that people were keen to know. And also in terms of expectations for this conference today, uh, we know that it is very much about getting to know the results of the projects, and that is very much the focus today, so we will meet that expectation, but also receiving information on how to use these results, which importantly we will get to, to the second phase of this conference in the afternoon with the, the program man or the project manager on this, Yannicka Haldin, about giving the sort of wider picture of the day, and also learning of the results in your own field of interest. So as been mentioned before, and you have the program on the website of when you linked into registration, this is a full day. Uh, we will have some breaks to make sure that we can have a bit of break. It's going to be a very presentation heavy day. Uh, and we will try and wrap up just before five o'clock finish time um, today. This is, of course, an online conference, which is recorded. Um, and we will have a, a very a varied uh, day of, of topics that I've mentioned, these four thematic themes. I really want to stress that we are very time constrained. So I would love to have questions just written in the chat uh, during the conference that I can bring up. We will have time for maybe one or two questions per presentation and that all presenters really keep to their time so that we really have courtesy to everyone to be able to have the same amount of time to present their results. Um, if I don't get to your questions, these will be documented and included in the memo at the end of the conference. So please don't be shy about your questions. We want engagement. We want to hear from you. So I propose that we start this conference um, and we start with the first uh, theme of this conference, which is biodiversity. This is activity two of the Blues project. Um, as many of you know, you know, protecting the marine biodiversity is one of the cornerstones of Helcom's work and has been doing this for decades uh, in these waters. And we knew that this is a unique uh, area, which I'm sure is very important to many of you who are studying, researching in this area, because of this uniqueness of the gradient of brackish water. And the Baltic Sea has really, um, together with all its uh, countries within the Baltic Sea Action Plan, agreed to not only better conserve um, this, these waters, but really to restore the biodiversity with more concrete efforts. So if you move to the next slide, uh, Johanna, please. Um, these are the different uh, partners uh, that have been involved in this project. As you see, there are quite a few um, and also subcontractors. If you move to the next slide, please. We will then go through five different topics. So we have five different pre presenters who will be tackling various tasks in this activity theme of biodiversity. As you can see on the slide, we will start with bycatch and then we will go to fish, which is focused on um, coastal fish assessments. We will then go to pelagic habitats um, specific, then to also um, harbor porpoise, one of the marine mammals or iconic harbor porpoise, and then branch out to something a little bit wider on the assessment of beet and beet is biodiversity assessment tools and food web approach. So I think without further ado, I would love to um, introduce our first speaker, which is Volke Dischka. I apologize if I've mispronounced your surname, uh, who will be focusing on the bycatch. So Volke is uh, co-chairs the Joint Marine Bird Expert Working Group uh, of Helcom, OSFAR and ICES and has over 30 years of expertise in marine birds and is currently engaged in the assessment of marine environment for the MSFD and the development of protected areas in German national waters. So please welcome Volke. Yeah, thank you, Ottilia. Um, I give this presentation on behalf of my colleagues Sarah Königsson from SLU and Sven Kuschinski from Meereszoologie. Uh, Together, we were working on the bikeage issue in the frame of activity two of a loose project. Um, can I? 
Okay. Uh, the bycatch issue needs uh, continued attention because we know about large numbers of marine mammals and water birds incidentally by caught in fishing gear for a long time. Um, but it is important to get more quantitative knowledge uh, about this issue, allowing to implement uh, appropriate measures to solve this problem. Um, this task consists of two components, while one subtask deals with the further development of risk area mapping. The other one is evaluating and testing assessment methods, which were proposed by experts on a joint ospa helcom workshop in 2019. Um, so coming to the first subtask, um, following the development of bike drift maps for harbor porpoise in the Baltic Sea in the Helcom Action Project, um, we continued working on this topic with other species, namely three species of seal and 11 species of water birds. Um, risk maps are based on survey data from seals and birds and fishing effort data. As the latter are available only on the spatial scale of ISIS rectangles, this scale was also used for the risk maps. Um, and roughly said, um, at the level of bycatch risk is expressed as a product of animal numbers, as shown on the left map, and um, the fishing effort uh, uh, expressed as a number of days at sea, shown in the central map. Uh, but um, the absolute numbers resulting from this multiplication, multiplication do not tell us much, so we only show relative bycatch risk. This allows to compare different areas in the Baltic Sea. Um, here you can see two of the many resulting maps, uh, one for the ringed seal population in the Bofnian Bay and the other for wintering red throated divers in the southern half of the Baltic Sea. The more red you see uh, on the map, uh, the higher there is the risk of bycatch in static nets in this case. As I said before, this procedure was done for three seal species and for 11 bird species, but always for four uh, gear types, uh, static nets, drawers, long lines, and finally, pot stripes and fike nets together. Uh, these risk maps highlight some areas where action against bycatch is urgently needed. Um, however, data on bycatch fishing effort and distribution of seals and birds are needed uh, to uh, or need to be increased in quality to allow more precise predictions of risk areas. But this is already a very good start, uh, which we have done in this project. Uh, coming to the other uh, subtask, so this this uh, second uh, bycatch subtask would need even more precise data on bycatch rates and fishing effort in order uh, to allow uh, to investigate uh, the impact of bycatch mortality on the viability of populations. For marine mammals, uh, the 2019 Ospa Helcom bycatch workshop recommended to use a method called uh, potential biological removal, um, PBR, uh, which gives a number of animals lost from both bycatch and hunting, but still allowing to maintain a given level of population size over 100 years, which when this um, number can be used as a threshold. This approach was modified in the Blues project and then applied to some seal populations. Again, following the workshop um, recommendations, um, we used another threshold for critically endangered or vulnerable populations, which is zero bycatch, uh, because these populations cannot tolerate any additional loss of individuals. Uh, for birds, the impact of bycatch mortality on the viability of populations should be analyzed by population modeling. However, data were not sufficient to do this in the Blues project, but a Polish study on sea ducks has shown that this is really possible if data become available in future. Instead, we use two other uh, thresholds um, recommended by the 2019 workshop for species on the Helcom red list, so which are already threatened. Uh, on uh, one threshold is that the level of 1% of annual adult mortality, uh, that means the product of bird numbers, mortality rate, and 1%. And the other threshold simply means that there is no bycatch occurring 
So known bycatch in a threatened species means that this species is not in good status. Um, well, eventually um, the assessments as described uh, just before uh, were done for the Helcom core indicator, which is called number of drowned mammals and water birds in fishing gear. And uh, this is feeding into Holler's free assessments. Um, we assessed six populations of four species of marine mammals uh, across their entire range and altogether 11 uh, water bird species on the spatial scale of aggregated sub -basins. In all these assessments, the threshold was exceeded, um, resulting in not good status of mammals and water birds in each part of the body sea covered by the assessments, uh, which is uh, shown on the maps. This means that good environmental status is not achieved in this case. Um, well, in summary, this task of uh, Helcom Blues has made progress in bycatch risk mapping and highlighted some high risk areas for mammals and water birds. And further, we could show that the examined seal and water bird species are not in good environmental status. Um, our key messages for science are that uh, where, applic where applicable um, bycatch assessments indicated negative impact on marine mammal and water bird populations. Um, we need more precise data of fishing effort in mammal and bird bycatch in order to quantify the impact of bycatch on the population level. And finally, high resolution bycatch assessments are required for development of targeted measures. Um, and our key messages for the policymakers are that bycatch in fishing gear threatens the viability of marine mammal and water bird populations in many, if not all, parts of the Baltic Sea. We need bycatch monitoring to allow ident identification of, of high risk areas and population effects as a basis for targeted management measures. And um, these measures uh, against bycatch must be taken to prevent deterioration of marine ecosystems. Um, yeah, about the use of our results so far and in future um, in Helcom, as I said before, uh, this work supports the core indicator or um, and the uh, about bycatch and the results are used for the Holas free thematic assessment of biodiversity. Um, our bycatch work is also linked to the Baltic Sea Action Plan goal. Baltic Sea ecosystem is healthy and resilient. And to the uh, management objective, uh, human induced mortality, including hunting, fishing, and incidental bycatch, does not threaten the viability of marine life. And uh, <clears throat> related to this uh, are the actions um, B8 and B33. Um, in the MSFD, uh, the results can be used for the Article 8 status reporting on the biodiversity criterion D1, C1, and there are possible links to the descriptor for about food webs. Uh, and there are links to other relevant processes, uh, for instance, the EU action plan against seabird bycatch, or the work in conventions like Escobins and AEVA. Uh, yeah, was, this work was uh, possible due to support from uh, some organizations and persons, um, uh, especially um, the ISIS region database, which supplied fishing effort data. The JWT Bird uh, experts compiled uh, data from the national monitoring schemes for uh, marine birds. Uh, seal data were supplied by Aarhus University, Luke and Swedish seal monitoring. Um, Dominik Markovsky uh, uh, supplied a water bird bycatch assessment uh, for Polish waters. Um, and the water bird bycatch assessment um, for the German waters was um, supported by DDA and BFN. Uh, also, we get so, got support from Activity 5 of this project uh, regarding data products, and of course, we use literature. Um, 
And last but not least, uh, with the development uh, and testing of threshold setting methods and evaluation scenarios was made possible by the help of uh, Markus Ahola, Mathieu Othier, Julia Karlström, Anita Gillis, David Lusso, and Kylie Owen. Yeah, and uh, of course we have two major outputs. Uh, this is the project report um, and the core indicator report, which is uh, supporting HOLAS3 assessments. And uh, yeah, finally, I thank you for your attention, uh, but I also want to thank the staff of the Helcom Secretariat for their great support throughout the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Holger. For some reason, there we go. I cannot get my video to work at the moment. Um, I'll get back to that. But thank you very much, Hol Volker. This was a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we have gotten some questions in the chat. So uh, one of the first questions is, in which fishing gears are the estimated bycatch rates the highest? Is it coastal static gears or offshore trolls? Um, that's definitely a static, uh, static nets, uh, gill nets, for instance, um, which are usually uh, placed close to the coast, uh, where usually most of the water birds are um, living in, uh, especially during the winter season. Um, at least in the Baltic, as far as I know, there's not so much bycatch. So, uh, in inshores. Um, so uh, static gear is the most important for both water birds and also marine mammals, of course. And, and following to that, uh, there's a question on water bird assessment. What rules of aggregation of assessments across species are applied? And here's an abbreviation that I'm not familiar with, but OOAO uh, slash conditional slash proportional Etc. I'm hoping you know this better than me. Yeah, well, um, in in this step or this stage of the assessment, so in the indicator, we um, only um, um, well, we assess the status of species uh, according to the bycatch, and um, because um, I think generally we we use one out all out, but uh, in this case all assessments were. Uh, showing poor status or not good environmental status. So um, and we are free of choosing uh, any method, but usually it's one out all out. Um, um, if that was the question. Yeah. You got a thumbs up. So I think you, you answered um, as, as was asked. And we have another question here uh, from Orian Esman on how much or how much must bycatches in general decrease to be considered okay? Um, I mean, in not threatening mammals and bird populations. I mean, you did manage, you know, you did mention that the sort of achievement is zero bycatch um, in in your slide. So maybe if you can uh, explain that a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, in the threatened and declining species, as I call in OSPA or redlisted species in Helcom, um, we usually uh, apply this rule that there should be no bycatch, especially if it's a uh, very uh, much threatened uh, population like the harbor properties, Baltic proper population. So um, then each individual uh, bycatch is too much. Um, uh, but for the more abundant species, it's uh, a bit more difficult because we need population modeling uh, to, um, to, uh, to check whether uh, or to, to find out the number which could be by caught uh, without consequences for population. As I said, um, uh, we have not enough monitoring, not enough quantitative data so far to um, apply these population models. Uh, so we very much hope that uh, because we ask for that again and again, but uh, more monitoring is uh, implemented, uh, allowing us to, to um, get more precise information about the thresholds, um, which are, um, or which, um, uh, which number of bicot birds or mammals, the population would be uh, uh, not viable anymore. So that's well, thank a you so plea. Much, it's a plea. It's a plea for more monitoring. Yes, yeah. good. I hope everyone noticed <clears throat> that this is a plea. Thank you so much, Volker. 
So we need to move on. Uh, we have now uh, as our next topic, uh, which will be on fish assessments, coastal fish. Um, and here we have uh, introducing Elisabeth Boulund, uh, who will be speaking about this improved assessment of coastal fish. Uh, she is a researcher at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, known as SLU, focusing on food web dynamics and ecological interactions of fish, mainly coastal areas, and leading us on the findings related to improved assessments of coastal fish species. So with that, I welcome you, Elisabeth. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me, yes? Great. Uh, yes, so as mentioned, I am here today representing the fish group consisting of Jens Olsson, Ariel Östman and myself. And I will dive straight into the overview of uh, our task, uh, which had two subtasks with the, del the deliverables of uh, developing an improved assessment approach, foremost for coastal fish, as mentioned, but also to look into this for species where ISIS do not provide analytical reference points. So this is a number of offshore species in the Baltic, mainly flatfish species and also stickleback. And the second subtask was to develop a size-based assessment for the same species and communities. So I will dive straight into the results for the first subtask, where we have developed an, uh, and applied an improved and, uh, methodology that we call ACIDS. And this method allows threshold setting and thereby a status assessment with a confidence assessment of the underlying data. And we have applied this in HULAS 3 to coastal fish key species perch, flounder, whitefish, pike, pike perch, and eel pout. And you see here uh, the two leftmost graphs, uh, examples of time series of abundance with yearly values. And we see that the method with this method, we can set a lower and an upper threshold value. And we compare the me resampled median of the assessment period with resampled medians of the reference period. And in this case, they almost completely overlap and we are highly confident in no change of status. In the second example on eel pout in Aarhus Bay, we see that the method can also handle time series where we have missing data in occasional years. In the third example, for coastal fish functional groups, we see cyprinids in Ronio and for cyprinids, we want abundance to not get too low or too high. And in this case, we see that status again has not changed. So we have also applied this, as I mentioned, we developed this method to apply it to species where ISIS do not provide analytical reference points. Uh, so here we see an example of a flatfish species. We were able to apply this to flounder, turbot, trill, and tab. And for flounder here in SD26 and SD28, we see that the resampled medians in the assessment period are lower than the reference period. Uh, there's very little overlap and we're quite certain of a change in status. In the three-spine stickleback example here, the method picks what we call a breakpoint because there is a structural change in the time series. So the years previous to the breakpoint in 2010 are chosen as the reference. And here we see a very clear increase. Moving on, we have also improved the spatial coverage by adding 19 new monitoring locations around the Baltic. And this has increased the, the, the sampling quite significantly in the Danish, Polish, and Lithuanian waters. So you see the new areas here in red compared to all the old uh, previous sampling locations in, in blue. So moving on to the 
second subtask of developing a size-based indicator. We started by looking at a number of different potential size-based indicators. Here you can see them illustrated on a size spectrum. And we landed on L90, the length at the 90th quantile of the size distribution, which is a, an indicator of the proportion of large fish in a given sample. And why did we choose this? Well, one important reason was if you look at the relationship between the precision of the estimate and the sample size, in these tiny graphs, we see that the precision on the y-axis decreases generally with sample size. But for many of these length measures, we still have quite a bit of uncertainty, even at high sample sizes. Whereas for L90, we get precision already from around 300 individuals and up. And this is quite important if we're working with survey data where we often have limited sample sizes. Another reason to choose L90 is if we look at how these different length indicate potential length indicators respond to human pressures. Here, you don't need to look at all of the details. It's basically an overview for four different groups or species of fish, we see how R is, in this case, L90, influenced by different human pressures. And the one thing that stands out here is that in the NOF, so the no fishing areas, which is the only areas here where you have absolutely no fishing, we see that uh, the proportion of large fish in the population is quite a bit higher in perch and in the group of large fish. And this suggests that L90 is uh, uh, responding to fishing pressure. So having chosen an indicator, how do we develop a threshold value and try to implement this? Well, first we go around and collect as much data as we possibly can from around the bulk, mainly survey data. And we apply some data selection criteria. We need a minimum sample size of these 300 individuals. We need at least six years of data. We end up with 33 monitoring areas with good data from PERC and only 16 monitoring locations in Flounder. And this is not surprising given that Flounder is a lot less abundant generally than PERC. We then analyze this data in a linear mixed effect model framework in R. And in all of these little miniatures here on the right, at the top you see the models for PERCH, where we see the expected value of L90 on the y-axis. So the expected value for different categories of our predictors as blue lines here, with residuals as gray dots in the background. So what we can see clearly is that if we use net links uh, uh, as the gear category, if net link is used in the survey fishing, we have it, we have a significant size selectivity and L90 becomes smaller. Whereas if we use spike nets and multi mesh, we register higher L90 values. So the L90 value is biased by which gear we use where it's, we do not see a difference depending on which season we fish in over time and no clear differences between, no consistent differences between regions. This is very different in flounder where we see a very strong effect of the type of gear we use, season in which we fish, a little bit of a trend over time and differences depending on the proportion of which ecotype dominates in the sample. So for PERT, we settled on a gear-specific threshold that's based on model estimated grand means accounting for these other biasing factors. Whereas in Flounder, it's difficult to disentangle the effects of gears, ecotypes, and geographic location. So there's no threshold implemented with the current data that we have available. So how do we implement this? Well, in HULAS 3, we apply this uh, new size-based indicator to look at the size structure of coastal fish using national monitoring data and also some commercial catch statistics. 
You see two examples here on the left, where again, we see pine theories with yearly L90 values. In Perch, in Fadefjaden, the threshold is 25 centimeters. We see that the median during the reference period is above the threshold, indicating good status. The reverse is true in Perch in the Coronian Lagoon, where the threshold is 23 centimeters and the median during the assessment period is below the threshold value. For flounder, we chose to illustrate this as trends over time so that we do provide some information, even though we cannot arrive at a formal threshold value at this time, but we can at least look if trends over time are significantly increasing or decreasing. Similarly, in commercials offshore species, where ISIS do not provide analytical reference points, we use data from the ISIS Dutchess database on the length distribution. And for the flatfish stocks where the sample sizes were large enough, you here see trends over time. And we see that in two of the stocks, we have a significant deteriorating trend over the last 10 years marked in blue. So in summary, assets provide thresholds with associated uncertainty. We have implemented this in HOLA's three coastal fish core indicators and flat fish stocks, and we have also implemented it on three spine stickleback. We have operationalized L90 as a size-based indicator and implemented this in HOLA's three with thresholds for coastal fish key species perch, and in HOLA's three for flat fish stocks as trends over time. Sorry, Lisa, but just to jump in, but you have one minute left. Great. Uh, and our key messages for science is that we have developed an improved methodology for analyzing structural change in time theories. We have improved functional understanding of spatial and temporal dynamics of both abundance and size. And we have uh, improved and extended status assessments as an implication for policymakers. Uh, we have use of our results so far in the future can be applied in a number of HELCOM, MSFD, and um, Baltic uh, BSAT uh, goals. And just in summary, again, our key outputs are to indicate a report for coastal fish for HOLAS 3, somatic assessment for fish and food webs for HOLAS 3 and two scientific manuscripts focusing on size-based indicators of coastal fish and an approach for der deriving threshold values for the size distribution. And this work was possible due to support from the HELCOM database pool, the ISIS, VGBFAS, and DATRAS national coasting, coastal fish monitoring programs around the Baltic, and not the least the HELCOM expert network on coastal fish. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for this interesting presentation. And sounds like it's been quite a challenging uh, venture to get to set up these thresholds for these different species. Um, a question I guess I have is you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you have set up new locations for monitoring. Um, and maybe if you can allude a little bit with that specific, or how were these chosen, for example, these new locations? And was it just for one species or could you address this for both? Because it sounded like it's very varied, whether you're looking at flatfish or um, pelagic fish. Yes, sorry, I, I was a bit unclear in my wording there. I meant that for us, they, they were new in the sense that they were new to be able to use them in this scheme because they have been used uh, monitoring usually has been done, but now these um, areas maybe have achieved enough number of years to be able to be informative so that you can have a reference period, or they were started to be sampled in a couple of the Swedish areas, they were started to be sampled during the last assessment period, and some of the international areas, for example, the Polish areas, have been sampled for some time, but have not been formally used in this uh, uh, in the, in the HOLAS three uh, reporting before. So it was just a matter of seeing monitoring locations that were suitable to be used in HOLAS three, but for various reasons, simply have not been used in that setting before. And they're mainly for the coastal fish species around the Baltic. Great, thank you for that clarification. One, one question has just uh, come in, so I'll try and get that, although we're running a little bit late. 
Um, do the L90 values, so the length values, call for more no fishing areas? And how big of an area should be free of fishing? These are very good policy, impl policy implication questions that yeah. I would not dare to, <laughs> I can mainly give a personal reflection on that, Please which do. is that we do <laughs> see a very large effect in no fishing areas and they do tend to be very beneficial. So it, it seems logical that it is a powerful uh, management uh, uh, action. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So now we will move on to pelagic habitats. Uh, we have Marie Johansson who will be presenting this. Um, um, Elizabeth, please, can you oh, stop yes, sharing? I'm trying to stop sharing. I am lost between all of my screens. Um, At the bottom, you should have a... Yes, I have lost, I only see you guys. I don't see, sorry, I am really... I think Jana has the host rights. Um, can so she perhaps, perhaps override me and yes. force me out? Um, it might be necessary, I'm afraid. I've hidden the controls. <laughs> so I can introduce maybe uh, Marie while we're, we're trying to figure out the, uh, the technical part. So uh, Marie Johansson uh, works at the Swedish Metrological and Hydrological Institute, SMHI, in Sweden. Uh, is an active member of the Helcom Phytoplankton Expert Group and leads this activity for the Blues Project in the themes of um, biodiversity, activity two, for the overall assessment of pelagic habitats, which includes both phytoplankton and zooplankton indicators. So please, without further ado, Marie, welcome um, to hold your presentation. Uh, I'm waiting for you to end your presentation. <laughs> There's a lot, lot of different slides. Uh, okay. that we'll yes, be I know. Today. Share screen, and I hope that's that one. And I hope you will see a presentation now. Yes, perfect. See the presentation, and yes. I will just quickly. Uh, yes. I have three um, monitors, and it's really annoying. But uh, if I just do like this, uh, will you see a second one? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to the floor. I, my name is Maria Johansson, as you said, and I'm really happy that you said my whole institute name because I hate to say it. Uh, I am the lead of this activity, the Pelagic Habitat, and uh, I have not been doing all the work, so uh, I've been leading this work. I would like to acknowledge the ones that are actually done the great work in this project. It's Elena Gordokova, Astra Lavutre, Andres Janus, <laughs> Iveta Jorgensone, and Arno Polemer. It's been a great team to work with, and it's, um, it's been, a, I think, a really success. We had quite an ambitious uh, plan. We had four subtasks uh, in this project. First two ones were to complete operationalization of two already existing indicators uh, that has been developed in the Helcom area. This is the mean size and total stock indicator and the phytoplankton indicator seasonal succession of pollinating phytoplankton groups. And uh, the uh, third task was to find a way to combine in, uh, pelagic habitat indicators into an overall habitat, uh, pelagic habitat assessment. And the fourth task was to have an outlook uh, and try to test other indicators uh, developed in the EU in the Baltic system. So that's the four main tasks we had. And we have some results at the end, but I will go through each task with results and slides. So the first task, uh, complete the operationalization of the Helcom zooplankton indicator. Well, it has been spatially coverage has increased immensely from six sub basins in the last assessment to 11 uh, to 10 in this uh, during this work. We are still missing some areas, so it's not complete, but that's due mainly to data issues. But the results we have from this uh, extensive uh, extended uh, assessment is that PES piece is not achieved in 50% of the assessment units, and it's primarily due to the shift towards the small body zooplankton. 
Uh, we also looked at the, uh, the long-term trends of the whole data sets in the area, and we see some negative long-term trends for mean size, but also for total biomass. And I would show a picture of that in the next slide. And uh, it implicates uh, the population demography analysis, implicates that predation pressure is a, as a critical driver for these changes. So looking at long-term data of zooplankton, you have on the, this side, or I can show, maybe I can just make this one. Uh, so this is the total biomass, and red is that it's decreasing, and green that it's okay. So it's really going down in the north of the Baltic Sea. Uh, it looks quite okay in the rest of the Baltic Sea. And looking at the mean size, how large the individuals are, you can see that it's uh, better in the North Sea, but in the, this part of the system, it's really bad in many areas. And it's uh, sometimes going in a negative trend. And sometimes it's getting a little bit better, but not statistically. Uh, so for the phytoplankton part, we also had a major increase in spatial coverage. Uh, last assessment, we had seven open seas bus sub-bases, and now it's 13. And we had six coastal water units, and now we have 13. So it's expanded a lot. But still, it's not completed because we are still missing some areas, and that's mainly due to uh, data issues. So how is the status? Well. GIS is not achieved in almost 75% of the assessment units of the Baltic Sea. And the, most of the deviations are due to increased biomass of diatoms or the ciliate mesodemium rubrum that was used in this assessment. Uh, we see some deviations <laughs> from the normal succession growth curves that we have, and they have become more frequent deviations in the northern parts of the Baltic Sea, but in the southern parts, it seems like it's going towards a greater stability. So, I was missing two. Yes, so how to combine indicators to have a more of a pelagic habitat assessment? What we decided in this uh, project was to use this zooplankton indicator, the phytoplankton indicator that I already mentioned, and combine it with another phytoplankton related indicator, the cyanobacterial bloom index, which, which used to be an eutrophication indicator, but it's using uh, and showing an, uh, uh, cyanobacterial biomass. So with these three together, we have one out, all out, and it will also do, then lead to um, a diversity assessment of the pelagic habitat. Looking at the eutrophication aspect, we also wanted to look at eutrophication indicators developed in, um, in HELCOM in the Baltic Sea, the chlorophyll A and the water transparency that together gives an eutrophication assessment. Having this picture in mind, we go to the same thing, but with the results. So this part, uh, let's see there. We have the zooplankton indicator and the results from that indicator. We have the phytoplankton seasonal succession indicator. And here we have the cyanobacteria bloom index, and it looks really red. But unfortunately, they are not in line in any areas. So the total assessment of the pelagic habitat is really bad with red everywhere, and that's below this. And for the eutrophication part, it also looks quite uh, sad and low keys in most areas, except for the area where uh, we have some promising results. But here we have, again, a bad situation for the biodiversity. This is, this is the way we try to combine indicators to have an uh, overall uh, tragic habitat assessment. So the last task was to have an outreach to look at other indicators that could be applied in the Baltic Sea. And we decided to use an OSPAR indicator called the PH1 Food Web 5 Plank Life Form Indicator and test it in the Baltic Sea. And we 
Of course, we were using an indicator that was developed for another pelagic habitat system with a lot of different species that we have in the Baltic Sea. So we had a pragmatic approach where we tried to pick out some life forms for phytoplankton and some phytoplankton, and they used these in three parts of the Baltic Sea, the Western Gotland Basin, the Bosnian Sea, and the Gulf of Riga. And here, you at the right-hand corner, you can see some of the results. This is for the cyanobacteria versus mesodinium rubrum. So you compare two different life forms and see the results of that. So I think it was quite a good exercise. And I think we all agree that it was possible to use this indicator in the Baltic Sea. But we saw some main challenges. Uh, that we need to find, find specific pairs of life forms for the Baltic plankton. Uh, and we also need to look at the sampling frequency as it's quite different from what they are, have been doing in or have in the OSPAR area. So for future works, we need to have a database for plankton functional traits specific for the Baltic Sea. And we need to identify ecologically relevant life form pairs where we can also combine maybe phytoplankton and zooplankton taxa in a life form. Uh, and we need to look at the data and see how we best aggregate our data to be. Marie, just uh, yes? to let you know, one minute left. Oh gosh, I'm talking too slowly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Here's some results. Well, as uh, previous uh, talkers have said, it will be feeding into many areas, the health one. Uh, Holder's thematic assessment of biodiversity is already fed into. Uh, it will feed into several goals of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And it will also help out, help out in the reporting of the MSFD of D1C6 and D4. So food webs. But I don't want to talk too much about this, so it's good. Uh, so data was achieved from the Healthcom Expert Group of Phytoplankton and Healthcom Expert Group of Zooplankton, and also from the ISS Dome database. And we had a lot of help from Hans Mose Jensen and Anna Spink. Uh, we also had some uh, facilitating uh, collaborations made from Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. The OSPA Nia Panacea project uh, has been very helpful. Uh, having us uh, understand how to work their um, indicator. And we also want to thank the EU Baltic Data Flow Project and especially Henrik Nygård for helping out with uh, several things. And this is the output so far, and it will feed into the Helcom Holas 3 report. Helcom Indicator Report has been improved, and hopefully, there will be future publications in peer reviewed journals. And by that, I thank you all for listening, and I hope there are some questions. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, yeah, so we actually do have uh, a question that has come and in. And I will end my, stop my sharing. Yes, that would be great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, one, one question here um, saying that this is a very interesting presentation. Um, and wondering if the predation pressure from the clupid fish is driving the NGS of the mean size of the zooplankton, then we should increase the fishing pressure on central Baltic herring um, that is already today overfished and to meet the zooplankton threshold value. What do you think about this idea? I think, Liana, uh, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, you yeah. some questions? That's a very nice question. This is why, exactly why, do you hear me, by the way? Yes, we hear you nice and clear. This is exactly why we proposed in the report, and I think in, the, some, in, in many other places, that soil plantings should be a part of the food web uh, indicator work. Uh, the assumption here is that the herring that is being fished upon is driving the plantain size, which I don't agree with because I think it's mostly not the herring of the commercial size that is not that much of the zooplanctivorous, but mostly stickleback and sprout that are doing it. Uh, but we do have a very strong indication that the zooplankton size is driven by predation because within a single population of a copepod, we also see the threat of removing adult stages 
which is only possible by predation from vertebrate predators. Hmm. Who is this predator is another question. And by the way, yeah. answering the question about the mnemiopsis, we don't have mnemiopsis in the central Baltic Sea, uh, in, at least in those quantities that can affect anything. Yeah. So but just it, in, in it, short, yeah. just to clarify, sorry, um, that you don't have sort of a response on the question about what is the specific predators who are putting this pressure on. It could be a varied... Uh, it might be, it's best to discuss with, again, with fish people, it might be sprat or stickleback, yeah. for example, okay. that are more plantivorous, at least mm -hmm. for in, in, in the, uh, for, for zooplankton. Mm -hmm. But Elena, can you ask a comment? Yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry, but we need to move on. <laughs> I'm sorry. You will have to do yeah. it on the chat or later. We really need to be uh, courtesy of everyone to be able to do the presentation. So, but I'm, I'm glad there's engagement and I want to keep this going. So if we can move on to the next presenter, apologies for that, I have to be stern. Uh, we're going to talk about harbor porpoise now. Uh, we have Anita Gillis, who will be presenting for us. Uh, she's a senior scientist at the University of the Veterinary Medicine in Hanover, uh, leads the OSPAR Marine Mammal Expert Group, and is a former co-chair of the IC's Working Group on Marine Mammal Ecology. And in health, I'm working on this as a co-lead for the indicator of the harbor porpoise on abundance and distribution. So please, Anita, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Otilia. I will share. Let me know when you can see it. Yes, if you can just put it on slide mode. Yep. Does that work? Uh, we get it as um, the more internal display. Mm. So, presenter mode. Presenter mode. Thanks, Janika. Slideshow. Does you anyone might have need to swap display settings, Anita, in the upper part where you can choose end show, tip, swap display, use slideshow if you go there to swap. Yeah, that one. Okay. There yes. we go. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Too many screens around these days. <laughs> so welcome again. Thanks. Thank, thanks a lot for having me today. So I will um, present, of course, on behalf of great co-authors and the co-workers in this task. So I also would like to acknowledge the colleagues from uh, my institute, Dominic Nachtsam and Osla Siebert, but also the colleagues from the Swedish Museum of Natural History, Julia Karlsson, Pia Eriksson and Kali Owen. Um, before we start or before we dive in the tasks that we have for the harbor porpoise, I would like to make you aware that we, the harbor porpoise, as you know, is the only cetacean species occurring year round in the Baltic Sea. But uh, nevertheless, the knowledge on population trends is limited. And what is important for you to follow uh, in the following um, uh, talk is that we are dealing with different populations. We are distinguishing three populations in the Baltic Sea and North Sea which is uh, the Baltic proper population in the inner Baltic Sea, then the Belt Sea population in the Western Baltic Sea, the Belt Sea, the Sound and the Southern Kattegat, and then the Northern Kattegat Skagak North Sea population. And these three populations are gene genetically and morphology distinct and have a limited geographic overlap. So th this just as a precap. Then uh, our subtasks, we had three of those. We first of all started to work on an improved harmonization between Halcom and OSPA regarding specific indicators on abundance. We then uh, aim to assess trends in abundance for the Belt Sea population, so in the Western Baltic Sea, and then had an expert-based qualitative assessment of the endangered Baltic proper population. So to start with our first um, workshop, we had with invited experts from HALCOM, E.G. Mama, and also the OSPA Marine Mammal Expert Group, so that was about uh, to discuss different analytical approaches to assess trends and also methods for threshold setting. Um, and this for sure um, increased our understanding of the uh, approaches, but also the limitations across populations and of course uh, improved the harmonization while still aiming for population specific uh, thresholds. For the work now presented under Halcom Blues, it was discussed to try a different approaches to assess and evaluate the trend for the Belsi population. And of course, we produced uh, a report on that. 
So we will um, strictly dive into this task, which is first, um, of course, to evaluate the data that is at, that we do have at hand. You might know the large scale scans and the so-called and also mini scan surveys that occur in this area. But you also see on the figure to the right, if you look at the cross hatched blue area, that there are certain areas that are and not covered or that are covered um, a bit larger than this area is the management area. So we first needed to decide which surveys and which data are um, available to use for us. Um, and uh, as you could see, the 1994, uh, sorry, now the 1994 survey, the first one has this huge gap in the east. So that's why we decided we could not use that survey. So that means we go ahead with the trend for uh, four surveys over 15 years from 2005 to 20. As said, we tried different approaches. I will, of course, I have not have the time to um, dive into all of them. This is the more complicated one. I'm sorry for that, but it's also the more intuitive one maybe. Uh, so our first analysis was a simulation approach using conventional distance sampling estimates. And this approach that you see here, it's a more in-depth analysis using a Bayesian analysis um, that, where, that has the advantage that it incorporates all sources of uncertainty that you might have, of course, when you estimate population of a wildlife species. Um, but by taking account of the uh, variability of the individual estimates and the associated errors, you also get a closer representation of the trend. To understand this figure is actually quite easy. On the top, you see a kind of slider bar turns red or green. So here we see it's about 68% in the red and 31% in the green. That means the trend that we see here, which is minus 1.1, um, is in fact has a huge support for a decline or higher probability than compared to no decline. But um, the but is it's associated with a wide credibility interval and uh, the other probability is not as high. So that means this is not a clear trend. Um, and that was also the result of the very other method we have. So not statistically significant if we want to put it like that. Um, and of course, such a short term trend, as I said, it's about 15 years is also hard to put into context um, from an ecological point of view, because um, it does not yet cover three generations of the species if we assume 7.5 years as a generation length for the harbor purpose. Uh, then next was um, the uh, so-called expert-based qualitative assessment of the Baltic proper population, so on the inner Baltic Sea which here means for our colleagues from the uh, Swedish Museum of Natural History to dive into old newspapers and really dust it all off, go back to the uh, starting in the 1850s up to now um, to look for historical records. Overall, um, new historic, I must say new because of course the Halcom Ascobans uh, database on porpoises that is available was used, but then more than 280 new historical records could be located by this adventure. Um, geographical positions were tried or were, were figured out based on these descriptions. You nevertheless see there are gaps uh, between the countries, but it's, uh, it's a huge compilation. What has been observed is there's a lower number of porpoises records observed over time. Um, we also uh, do have uh, here a distribution map in this case, it is, you see, dead encounters. So the uh, compilation was made of um, incidental sightings, but also bycatch records, stranding records, um, and also other descriptions. So here is the map on uh, dead encounters. You see that there are far less records in recent, in recent years compared to historically um, obser observations of this of the reported dead animals, especially in the northern section of the um, historical range. Um, if then, of course, the, since it's a qualitative assessment, um, we, we decide or we, we put it all together and the status uh, is non-GES, as you see here, it failed GES. So abundance was likely in order of magnitude higher than currently based on historic sightings and also on the bycatch rate and the uh, historically commonly distributed much further north than currently accepted uh, as you see here in the range. So this was pretty obviously from this expert-based qualitative um, assessment. 
So um, to sum to sum the uh, to sum our deliverables and results. So for the very first task, subtask, we really had an extensive discussion between the expert groups, which uh, allowed an increased efficiency in the indicator development and also for the future assessments. Then the subtask two, as said before, while uh, these different approaches that we followed showed no statistic statistically significant trend. There was some indication of a decline in abundance of the Belt Sea population over time, and we actually do have now uh, a new data point in time. Last year, we had the SCANS4 survey, so we can enlarge the time series, and we also have methods at hand to also uh, utilize the 1994 results. So hopefully in future, we have a better data um, base to have more power on the trend. On the subtask, uh, the last one, uh, as said before, the Baltic proper population does not achieve GS for both abundance um, and distribution. Uh, and uh, what are our key messages for science? So um, the thresholds used for these indicators, they really should be population specific. That's actually, that's really important. It should also consider the available data also the historic ones, if you have them at hand, or so if you have any means of getting uh, getting hold of that. The population dynamics needs to be taken into account, uh, the existing pressures, but of course also uh, all new methods on setting thresholds, which could be also with population dynamic uh, modeling. Then we need long-term data sets, as just said before, to assess the trends as we could only have these four data pay points over the short term per time period of 15 years, which is hard to put into context, as it does not cover these three generations for the species, which is again bound to, for instance, threshold setting by the IUCN, if you want to categorize populations uh, as being uh, threatened or endangered, for example. Then uh, we could show that the reviews of old newspapers and really diving into old historical records can provide useful data if you have a data deficient species or population, as we know for our uh, inner Baltic proper population, where it's hard to really do um, population level surveys. Then for policy, um, what, what is important is the harmonization between the regional sea conventions, which should be further encouraged. encouraged since it allows an increased expert support and also reduces the analysis and the development time for the incorrect indicators. Um, here, for instance, for the porpoises, we also have an overlap. So the North Sea population and the Belt Sea population, that's, uh, that's of course uh, in, a, in a neighbored area. And it's very important to have the indicators comparable. Anita, the second... you're running out of time. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'm good. Um, and then of course, um, what is important to know is that a lack of a statistically significant trend does not mean that the population is in good status. So this should not be taken as granted, but must be reviewed really carefully why that is. Um, the Baltic proper population does not achieve GES, urgently needs an updated abundance estimate and was historically distributed much wider than today. And the use of the results, um, as said, for the other biodiversity components, of course, um, this work uh, was used in Hakum Holders 3 uh, for the indicators, but also for the thematic assessment. It is relevant for the uh, Baltic uh, species, the action plan um, for the different goals and the ecological objectives, specifically for the actions B8 and B33. Of course, other processes in the EU, like the MSFD reporting, but also for the Habitats Directive reporting, could also think of the uh, biodiversity strategy and ASCOBANS. The data came, or the, the work was possible due to support uh, from the various expert groups, uh, also from the OSPA expert group here, a special thank also to Mathieu T, who helped with the trend analysis. We used the Helcom ASCOBANS purpose database and, as said, the scans and mini scans projects and of course uh, had various contributors to all the historical records across the different countries. So thanks a lot for your attention. The outputs you uh, see here as well, we will um, also work on um, publications and I also want to thank Jana and all the coordinators for a great project. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much Anita and it's great if you can stop sharing the presentation.
Um, I mean, an interesting presentation with a lot of challenges, as I can see, is this being more of a qualitative way of doing the assessments. Interesting that historical data has been able to be used. I just uh, a, a quick a curiosity question, I guess, for me is, um, you know, what do you see as the biggest challenge with, with the fact that there's qualitative data, there isn't this ability to really do the, the sort of statistics on it. I mean, within the science, you listed a few of these um, areas where there needs to be better um, data collection to setting the threshold. So what would you say is sort of the key priority that the scientific sort of assessments should be looking at? Well, I think... Uh... First of all, there are there are data available that we can use. It's not that it's only qualitative. It's just for the historical records. Um, it's of course hard to to do it. So we really must also work more on these how to really utilize and put it more into a qualitative um, evaluation. But for the trend analysis, I think also much more work on the um, on the statistical side of things and development of new methods is is for sure on the upfront. And we have means by hand. So all these new available Bayesian techniques to really help us also to work with the probability of these different kinds of uh, data that we have. And uh, I think the more we work also on uh, habitat models, so really utilizing other information from other ecosystem components that will help us also to put more power on the data that we collect, if we can put it in a, a larger context, this will help to soak up variability of our sighting data, of course, that you can imagine is difficult to collect for a species that is uh, cryptic and uh, diving. Great. Thank you so much, Anita. So moving on to our next speaker, Henrik Nygård, uh, who will be now taking us on a sort of a broader level on food webs uh, and what we call BEAT, the biodiversity assessment tool, as well as indicator-based integration tools. Uh, Henrik is a senior research scientist at the Finnish Environment Institute, working with monitoring and assessment of the Baltic Sea and is mainly focusing on benthic habitats. Uh, he works with the project on integrating the assessments of biodiversity and food webs. So with that, I invite Henrik to the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, I just share my screen. Can you see it now? Is it in uh, yes. Yes. presentation mode? I probably have to click this button. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, this uh, task uh, two point five of the Blues project is uh, on the uh, assessment of biodiversity, as as we heard. And on this task, uh, I have had uh, Yuri Tiranemi from Sika also, and Astra Labutse from uh, Latvian Institute of Ecolo uh, aquatic ecology, and also Georg Martin from the Estonian Marine Institute as co-workers. And here we, uh, well, a bit different from these earlier tasks. We we had a, uh, it's been a bit more technical work. We have been developing further the the beat tool to to do the assessment, but also had uh, some exploratory work. On, on food web assessments for Holas 3. So just uh, going straight to, to the results and what we have been doing. Uh, it's good that uh, we have had these uh, earlier presentations now. Then you see all the development that has uh, taken place since uh, Holas 2 and things that needed to be uh, included into the BIT tool and, and uh, updated in. So First, uh, we had some new species that have, were not assessed in, in uh, Holas 2, for example, harbor porpoise, then the number of bird species and uh, fish species assessed has also increased. So those were included. Then there has been some updates to the spatial assessment structure, and especially uh, the eutrophication assessment units have been modified a bit. So. Those were also included now in, in the BEAT tool, according to the latest updates. And uh, we also added new indicators to the tool. And uh, we have already had presentations of all these indicators, so I don't need to go into detail on that. So that's a good thing. 
Then uh, on the integration structure, uh, we had, or Marie presented the pelagic habitats uh, methodology and, and uh, when it comes to be it, we had to to update the weighing of the pelagic indicators and also the a bit the integration structure. So this work was done, and also for the other uh, for the other uh, ecosystem components, the integration structure and integration rules were modified uh, according to to the MSFD Article Eight guidance. And also based on on uh, expert workshops with all all these or separate workshops for all ecosystem components where we got good input from all the experts on how to do this, and then we just had to implement the changes into the bit tool. So for fish, uh, we changed to a species-based integration uh, where we first. Uh, yeah, assess the species and then the species were one out all out between the species to get to the species groups. For birds, a bit similar, but as we have more more species, the one out all out between species were not uh, applied, but but instead the 75% of species needed to be in good status for the species group to be in good status. And then one out, all out <clears throat> between species groups. For the marine mammals, we adapted the integration rules according to habitat directive uh, evaluation, evaluation process. And uh, this means that we uh, evaluated the different components as also set by the habitats directive. So it's it's the components on abundance distribution demographic and habitat quality and also taking it into account the bycatch pressure and uh, in the figure you see an example for the harbor harbor porpoise uh, and for this uh, species we don't have any indicators on on habitat quality or demography so so it was uh, basically integrating the abundance and distribution indicators together with the bycatch. So that's in short what was done for the bit tool. Then we have the the uh, food web assessment and the, the work of improving the the assessment and this work was done in quite close cooperation with the correspondence group on food webs, later the expert group on food webs. And uh, here we first had an approach to uh, review the HELCOM indicators and see which indicators do cover the trophic yields as defined, defined to be assessed in the MSFD. And uh, we see that for many species groups, we have indicators uh, already in place. But when we go to the trophic guilds, we see that we don't have indicators for many. For many trophic guilds, we don't cover the whole trophic guild. And, and uh, although there is some parts of the guilds uh, that are assessed by indicators. So in the future, we're, or in the work we did when we reviewed the indicators closer, closer we focused on, on indicators that uh, address food web aspects more directly and not only the abundance of a species or species group within a tropic guild when not covering the whole guild. So uh, in, the, in, well, in the next slide you will see uh, a bit uh, narrower selection of indicators which we uh, analyzed further. But what we can see also here is that uh, although the indicators do not explicitly address uh, food web aspects, we have quite a good data available 
for, for most of the trophy kills that can be used in further indicator development to, to more focus on, on specific food web indicators. So there is data available, but it's not uh, used in a way that can support the food web assessment at the present. So, as I said, we dig into a few of these indicators more closely, and, uh, and this is just a summary of the result, which, uh, which of those indicators show good, good status, uh, green, and, and bad or, or not good status with red. And then these yellow uh, fields are, are where either the coastal area or, or the open sea area showed good and the other bad. So there was an overlap. But the overall picture is that, uh, that uh, for most, most of these indicators, it's, uh, or looking at the food web as a whole, it's uh, uh, the good status is not achieved. Then further, apart from also from uh, looking at the indicators, we also uh, reviewed other methods to assess food webs. And then for this, we uh, made use of, of uh, the bonus X webs projects results, and also did this in quite close cooperation with the correspondence group on food webs. And we identified a few few methods that are uh, at this point already usable for for Holas 3 and one of them was the integrated trend analysis Henry uh, sorry to jump in but you have 1 minute left okay thank you so we did a case study in the botnian sea using trend integrated trend analysis where we collected data for this analysis and the analysis was actually done by SLU and uh, uh, yeah, so we provided only data for this and other methods that were, were used uh, in, in uh, the CG food webs was uh, uh, ecosystem models like uh, Ecopath with uh, Ecosyn with Ecopath. So as I said, this is just, uh, we fed into the Holos 3 report basically the key messages is that uh, we need still further indicator de development to cover all biodiversity aspects and also specific food webs indicators are needed where we can include energy flows and uh, energy trans transfer efficiency and uh, for the integrated assessments the threshold setting is important uh, as we need to have a comparable thresholds so the definition of good environmental status should be should be similar in all all uh, indicators in order to to make a meaningful integration and then policy uh, key messages uh, well monitoring is the foundation of the impact of the assessments so it's important to continue and develop the monitoring to also take into account new aspects uh, it's advantageous to to streamline the different uh, assessments like the habitats directive and msfd and also other and also if uh, we want to do ecosystem based management we need to include food web aspects more more in a better way so how these results have been used uh, well they directly feed into the Holas 3 uh, thematic assessment of biodiversity. They also respond to the Botic Sea Action Plan goals and uh, some specific action there on, on improving the indicators and assessment uh, assessments and also facilitate the members, EU member states on, on the reporting uh, of MSFD. So, uh, I just want to thank uh, Helcom Indicator Leads and the experts that have contributed to, to uh, the integration process or, or how to update the integration process. And for the food webs work, uh, we thank uh, 
the correspondence group on food webs and uh, Sike, Luke and ISIS for data contributions and SLU for doing this uh, analysis for us on, on the integrated trend analysis. So outputs are found in, in uh, the Holas 3 assess assessment and the updated B tool will be published on, on GitHub. It's not there yet, but it will be soon. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. Um, we're, we're, we're going to just now go into a coffee break, but I thought I would just give you one question um, before I sort of move on. Um, but I mean, what, what we've heard in this sort of session all in all, there's a lot more now indicators, a lot more assessments that are being done to sort of make it more robust for the region. And so if you compare what you have uh, in the food web analysis for the HOLAS 2 and what will be going into the HOLAS 3, what would you say is the most significant? Uh, I think uh, we have a much better uh, overview now as we in HOLAS 2 it was uh, really a, uh, only a qualitative assessment of, of the key uh, indicators <laughs> contributed there or, or some ecosystem components. Now we have uh, widened the selection of indicators that we included for this qualitative assessment. And also then we have this more quantitative assessment uh, looking at uh, uh, changes over time, trend analysis, and also making use of ecosystem or food web modeling. And, and by that also able to project these changes and, and uh, into the or it will be in the future also to to make use of these projections into the future so great i would say that's that's thank you very much henrik so we are now kind of through the first thematics which was biodiversity and uh, we will have a, a a 30 minute break or roughly a 30 minute break so we are back now uh, for a new theme, the second theme uh, of this project, which is activity three, uh, which is on marine litter. Um, but before we start with the presentations on this, we would like to premiere some videos. So you are the first, um, let's say, uh, what do you call it, uh, audience to see these, these three videos that have been also produced within the, the Blues project, uh, as well as a new website that will guide readers on all these indicators that are now being developed through the project in helping to do the monitoring and assessments for Helcom. So to present this first video, uh, I would like to give the floor to Jana Wolf, who most of you already know, very familiar with her as being the project coordinator and has worked with several projects within Helcom related to the HOLAS uh, in all themes of biodiversity, databases, sufficiency of measures, the list goes on. So Jana, please indulge us with the premiere of uh, one of these videos. Yes, thank you very much, Otilia. So welcome back from the coffee break, also from my side. I hope you're eager to continue now. So during the morning session, we had the opportunity to hear a lot about the work on biodiversity-related tasks of the Helcom Blues project, and this often takes indicator work. So as a kind of a continuation of the topic of indicators, I would like to share now with you a video about indicators and the new indicator website. Uh, the video is intended for public outreach and as a general dissemination tool also after the end of the project time and it will be made available on the project website. So I will try to share the screen now with you for the video. I think you should see it now. Yes. But I think, let me redo this i think i forgot to say i want to share the sound also very important feature for the video and here we go so the video is about one and a half minutes long so enjoy trying to protect the environment can feel like an overwhelming task to get started there are many open questions how big is the problem how to set appropriate targets and importantly, how to track progress. 
To understand how our actions affect the marine environment and whether we're heading in the right direction or not, we need an indicator. HELCOM works to develop new and improve existing indicators for the Baltic Sea, looking at both the state of the environment and pressures that affect it. There will soon be more than 50 HELCOM indicators in place. The ultimate goal is to protect the Baltic Sea from the negative effects of human activities. After setting up concrete goals such as litter reduction, HELCOM creates specific indicators. They are tools for measuring progress towards the goal. Indicator development relies on the best available science. A key element of an indicator is the threshold value, which sets the level at which the status of the environment is considered good. For example, for beach litter, the threshold value determines how many items are too many at a 100 meter section of beach. Using the indicators is closely linked to accessing reliable monitoring and data from all the Baltic Sea countries. Indicator evaluations help us understand the current situation in which direction we're moving and if we need to take action. Many of the Helcom indicators are developed under projects such as Helcom Blues. Indicators help us to achieve our goal, a healthy Baltic Sea. Trying to okay, so that was the first showing and the premiere of the indicator video. I hope you like it. And next, directly leading on to the indicator website, I will share my screen now with you. So here you can see the new Helcom indicator website. Uh, on the first landing page, you will have some general uh, information about this website with links to the indicator menu, information about threshold values and filtering of the indicators. You will find all the indicators that we have at Telecom on this website with some uh, quick selections for type of indicator, or you can order them alphabetically or by sub segment. So here you then see them in blue related to biodiversity, in green to eutrophication, uh, purple to hazardous substances and pollution related topics, and uh, sea based activities in yellow. Uh, you can go to the page about the indicators, which has some brief background information, as well as the general about this site information for anyone interested. And the part probably most of you are interested in is the filtering of the indicators. So here you can, uh, you can choose between different types or categories. You can choose topic like mammals, hazardous substances, a specific subsegment, or you can filter it by MSFD criteria if you like. Then you can filter and get all the indicators that fit your filter criteria. So here, for example, cadmium, you can have a brief overview of what this indicator report would be about. You can select to see the entire report if you like, where you always start with the key message, and this part will always be visible. And then you have different sections that you can open and close depending on your interest. Uh, it's also possible to download the full indicator report as a PDF document, so you can then read it uh, whenever you feel like. And uh, yes, you can also go back to your filtering sections and uh, readjust the filtering uh, to your liking. And uh, this concludes the brief showcasing of this new indicator website. So as I mentioned, it will become available uh, end of March with all the new indicator reports. And I see there are a lot of uh, comments in the chat, but I think no questions so far, but if you still have any, feel free to put them in the chat. And with this, uh, thank you very much and back to Otilia. Thank you so much, Jana, and what an extensive work 
I'm sure has been uh, happening behind the scenes to get this website going, as well as the very nice um, video, which is a, a very nice digestible sort of understanding of this project, which is, you know, very sort of scientific heavy. So just well done for all of those involved. And a lot of positive feedback from all the uh, participants as well on the video, as well as the website. So as Jana said, this will go live then in March. Um, and uh, just out of curiosity, then this is accessible for everyone, not just sort of the Halcom family in a sense, the contracting parties, but this is an sort of open access uh, website for everyone. Yes. Okay. Super. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And we look forward then to the premiere of two other videos that are coming later today that are linked to different um, setups. But very nice interlude uh, with this first video, kind of looking at uh, marine litter as, a, as an example, beach litter. And that's what we will be focusing on now in this session. Um, so actually, if you could just put up the slide, Johanna, for this new activity area, the, the activity three project area of marine litter. Yes, thank you. So marine litter, as we know, is a very visible problem along the Baltic Sea coastlines. And uh, we're gaining more and more knowledge on how this is actually appearing under the surface at various size classes. And uh, it really is devastating um, how it has effects on the marine food web as well as habitat quality. And it's estimated, uh, numbers have come out of Helcom, that about 70% of the marine litter in the Baltic Sea is actually plastics. So um, Baltic Sea has actually been working quite an extensive time on marine litter and has had working groups on this. And I would say maybe in the regional seas perspectives has been a forerunner in creating regional action plans in this area and have set uh, a regional goal to reduce the amount of marine litter significantly by 2025, which essentially is around the corner in just two years, and to prevent also the harm that litter has uh, to the coastal and marine environment. So on the slide here, you see that we will have two presenters tackling uh, marine litter. One will be focusing on beach litter and the other one on micro litter. So with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker, which is Eva Blidbal uh, on beach litter. She is a member of the Helcom Expert Group on Marine Litter, OSPAR's Intercessional Correspondence Group on Marine Litter, and the EU Technical Group on Marine Litter. She has over 10 years of experience working with marine litter issues through an organization in Sweden called the Keep Sweden Tidy Foundation and has led national beach litter monitoring programs on behalf of the Swedish Water and Marine Agency, short known as SWAM. So please, Eva, uh, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Otilia. Uh, I will uh, share my screen. hope you could uh, see it in that mode. Can you click the presentation mode, please? Uh, it, it looks like it, it is in my screen, but you don't see that or? Uh, the, it's the small <clears throat> icon on the, on the bottom. Uh, near the minimizer. Yeah, um, I see it in the presentation mode in my at my computer, but you don't do that or? We can see the slides. Um, but not in the presentation mode. Yes, no, it's not in presentation mode. Sorry? It is it's not in, in presentation mode. It's not, mm -hmm. okay. Um, if you have two screens, it might be that you're sharing the screen that's not in presentation mode. Okay, I will try um, to see if I do like this then. What do you see now? It's it's the same. Um, it's the same. Hmm. Uh, I can take over uh, mm -hmm. if you prefer. Yes, maybe that's the easiest way. <laughs> okay. You could do that. 
I, I stop sharing my screen. Sure, just let me know then when um, you want me to change the slide. Yeah. One moment, please. There we go. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, and thank you very much for uh, this uh, good presentation and uh, showing the new indicators site on the website. It looks very nice. My name, as said, is um, Eva Blidberg and I work at Keep Sweden Tidy and uh, I have been working on this activity three a31, which is beach litter. So you could change the slide. I am trying to change. <laughs> yes, all these technical yes. problems. Um, yes, and it, it, as you see, saw before, there were um, two subtasks on the beach litter, which was a translation of historical litter data and the execute assessment of beach litter. And I was just want to highlight that we are now talking about uh, macro litter, which is above 2.5 centimeters. Uh, you could change the slide. Yes. So uh, I think the first task was uh, quite straightforward uh, to be able to to do this assessment in HOLAS 3. We were uh, forced to harmonize the data and there were a common list of beach litter developed and you are not um, expected to, um, to read um, uh, the uh, the Excel file, but I just wanted to show you that how, how, what it looked like. It was, it, it is now uh, eight different lists that are used in the Helcom area by, as you see, Germany, they have two different lists and they are not, they are not so uh, big differences, but still uh, when doing this, we had to uh, or I had to, to merge um, litter items into bigger categories. And when, when the, this was done, um, the HELCOM uh, group on, working group on marine litter uh, accepted or agreed on this list. You could change the slide, thank you. Uh, yes, so for the second task, um, the assessment was made on total count of litter uh, on plastics, the single use plastics and fishing related litter items. And the median values for total count of litter were compared with the Helcom threshold value of 20 litter items per 100 meter coastline as so, uh, you see saw in, uh, in the video. We also made trend analysis for the assessment period and a top 10 list of litter items for the entire Baltic Sea. So you could change the slide. Yes, and um, <clears throat> this map uh, shows uh, which sub-basin that uh, achieved or not achieved good environmental status um, in the assessment. And this was done on median beach litter values um, on total count and uh, the comparison with the threshold value, as I said. And uh, as you see, 11 sub-basin out of 16 did not achieve the good environmental sta status. And behind these values are uh, three sub-basins, which are well above the threshold value. And this was the Sound, the Gulf of Riga, and the Eastern Gotland Basin. And the other sub-basins that were above the threshold value were uh, relatively close uh, to the threshold uh, with values of 23 to 33 litre per 100 metre coastline. 
And <clears throat> six of these subbasin uh, show significant improvement trends. And only the Gdansk basin is showing a downward trend or an upward trend, sorry, an upward trend, the, the, the increasing trend that uh, shows that the, the environmental status uh, get worse. And uh, the other sub-basins results were not significant. So you could change. Uh, when it comes to the results for single-use plastic, uh, the medians of uh, single-use plastic litter items varies between 0 and 26 litter items per 100 meter beach and sub-basin. And it appears that this is the driving force in the time trends. And only, again, a Gdansk basin showed an upward trend. For fishing related items, there were similar results and the significant trends for fishing, litter, uh, fishing related litter items are going downwards for uh, Arcona Basin and the Eastern Kotlin Basin and upwards for the Gdansk Basin and the Bathonian, uh, Bathonian Sea and the Bornholm Basin has a stable level. So uh, you could change the slide. Uh, the top 10 beach litter categories um, for 2016 and 2021, uh, the, the top, the most, how do you say, uh, the, the most common litter category was various plastic items and fragments that were above 2.5 centimeters. And this was an uh, expected results since uh, this, category um, were the biggest one with a lot of different litter items that were not, we were not able to place somewhere else in the list. Uh, and uh, for the other um, uh, litter items in the list, plastic packaging for food and beverage or plastic bags and plastic caps and lists, they are all correlated to, uh, to the sub a directive or the single-use plastics and um, as I said before they seems also to be the driving force for the negative trends um, or the downward trends so this is sort of um, positive I think because then we could expect uh, less litter items on our beaches in the future. Uh, I think you could change slide um what we need to do uh, or what we suggest to do uh, in the future is that we need to work on harmonization of beach litter protocols um, in in the Helcom area we need a uh, better uh, coverage uh, of geographical coverage with improving monitoring efforts uh, to ever evaluate the effect of again of actions against marine litter, and we also uh, give need to give more attention to the sub basins assessment that are influenced by the types of beaches that are included in our monitoring. We need more research on in identifying source of litter. And we also need um, to expand the monitoring programs and research on sources and impacts and uh, further work on actions against marine litter is required to reach good environmental status in the Baltic Sea. I think you could change the slide. So uh, the use of of the results has or is still is um, for Helcom the core is the core indicator and it's a dedicated section of the whole us through assessment as part of the pollution theme for the Baltic Sea action plan it, it contributes to the implementation of action HL32 on the further development of core indicators on marine litter 
And for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, this could help reporting on uh, the 10 in artic Article 8 uh, for those health countries that are uh, members of EU. And for the EU processes, we have had a cooperation and communication with the EU TG Marine Litter during the Blues project lifetime. So to take the next one. Uh, and I like to thank the Health Comm Secretariat, uh, especially for the activity 53 and Joni Kataranta um, for the help with um, this task in the Health Comm Blues project. And also Emodnet uh, database and additional national data providers. Um, and also Jakob Strand, which is the co-lead for beach litter in the Helcom expert group on marine litter, and of course all the other members in this expert group. Uh, I wish to thank because they have uh, provided me with um, good advice during the time. I think you could change. Yes, and the last outputs here. The as we have heard, the indicator report on macro litter on beaches will be published in March, and the common litter item list will be included in this indicator report. And then we have the thematic assessment input for HOLAS 3 during uh, 2023. I think uh, that was all. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva. And we have had some questions trickling in uh, on your presentation. Uh, so one is uh, a question that I also had because there was quite a lot of um, different, I mean, spatial differences across the HELCOM assessment units that you presented on the status. And so uh, a question from participants here, is this due to current consumption patterns or maritime traffic routes or something else? Um, could, could you elaborate a little bit more, maybe, what the reasons are? Yes, um, I think that, I mean, currents could be a reason, of course. I, that it is probably uh, different uh, aspects on this, why it's different between different, um, different sub-regions. Sub but um, I also think that the output from from rivers could be one of the 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 things that that makes it differs um, and also what i said about the different types of beaches if if there's a many many beaches that uh, are used by tourists for example of or if you have beaches that are not visited almost at all, this, this also makes it uh, like not really comparable. Uh, so we wanted, we, we suggest to, to look forward into these data in the future. Yeah, and, and uh, a reply to that also that's come up is, for example, in Northern Germany, the reason maybe for this, this sort of skew in the data is maybe that you have only rural beaches which are not monitored or part of this. Mm. So it maybe has you know, some nuances to think about um, on, on what you've, you've sort of portrayed. I guess the question I had, which I was a bit curious about was you said there was an upward trend specifically in the Gdansk Basin and the Bothnian Sea. Can you explain why you think particularly there there's this upward trend? No, uh, I, I don't have the answer on that, but what could what maybe need to be said as well is that in the Gdansk Basin, you also they, they, the level is uh, below uh, the threshold value. So I mean, it could be maybe just um, occasional that it's going up, uh, but it's also on on the fishery so yeah i i don't know really actually the the reason behind mm. this but you mm. could elaborate on it of mm. course 
Globally, we've seen during the pandemic that there was a huge increase in face masks, which has caused, you know, an additional problem uh, when dealing with litter generally, and there is also plastics in these and, and not very good waste disposal. So there was a question here about have you seen any kind of differences or explosion of these masks? And in what category would you list them in the categories you had for, for um, this yes. litter? Yes, I think that, uh, well, for this assessment, we were not able to have uh, those face masks as a single category because not all the lists had included them. Uh, and uh, they otherwise they are on, um, let's see, it could be medical uh, litter items or plastic litter, uh, med plastic litter items that they are categorized like. But for, an, for Sweden, for example, which I'm most familiar with on a national level, we haven't seen uh, um, explosion of these litter items because, and I think that's because we don't use, we haven't used them so much. But I also think that the, uh, we maybe react a little bit. Um, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of reports where they have found uh, these litter items, uh, especially maybe in the cities, but also on beaches. Uh, but that's nothing that we could uh, find out in this data. Great, thank you so much, Eva. There's one more question, but I, I need to unfortunately move on. So maybe you can answer it in the chat. Yeah. Um, that would yes. be great uh, by Sven uh, Konishki. I would appreciate that and we will move on. So still keeping in the theme of marine litter, we will now go to the nitty gritty, the micro litter. We've just had the, mi the, the macro, now we go into the micro, and uh, we have the pleasure of Elke Fischer, who will be presenting for us. Uh, Elke is a senior researcher at the University of Hamburg and heads the working group for microplastic contamination and is a member of the Helcom Marine Litter Expert Group, as well as the EU Technical Group on Marine Litter, and also leads this activity on micro litter within this project. So please, Elke, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will start sharing my screen. Just a second. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me. And I'm very happy to present this subtask on my collector and a bit sad as well because it means the end of the project. And it was a real good one and nice one. So I'm going to present you uh, the subtask on activity three on microliter on behalf of, of course, a larger group, which are the colleagues from Latvia, which is Jeva Pusanimane and Marta Barone, and Helcom, Marta Ruiz, and uh, Jana Wolf, who so much um, guided us so well through this whole project. And of course, my own working group. Um, and um, I have Laura Polk and Madina Dolly with me today. Um, so about the overview on the task, we had a lot of subtasks, so we identified five of them. First of all, we wanted to carry out a review and an evaluation of the current process applied for the monitoring of microliter, which is um, intended to be based on two compartments, which is the water column and the bed sediment. Uh, the second subtask was to draft guidelines for the monitoring on for both of these compartments, which is the huge subtask. And then we had another subtask on a data collection of the microliter in these compartments. And also, as a final outcome, we wanted to specify the prerequisites for the monitoring um, of microliter. And to, yeah, to evaluate um, as well the guidelines, we carried out two screening studies based on literature data within the water column uh, and on real environmental samples on that sediment. So, to present you some of the results. Uh, first of all, the review and evaluation of current approaches. Uh, we carried out a survey. Uh, with, um, first of all, we initiated an, an, an expert network and a group of experts from all uh, health countries. And we received feedback uh, through these national experts from nine health countries on both of these compartments. And we um, uh, some information and data were recorded on 
first of all, general data? Is the monitoring already existing? Is it established? Are data available and so on? But we also ask for sampling strategies, uh, number of sampling stations, device used, and so on. And the user part on the laboratory analysis, sample treatment, and methods of particle analysis. And these outcomes were presented and discussed within a technical workshop. We had several of them, and they were very fruitful and helpful. And these outcomes, they served as the basis for drafting the guidelines. That was the second um, subtask, drafting the guidelines. So um, after the review, what is existing, what is done so far, we reckon that there are not so much differences, and we drafted the guidelines and have them discussed with the national experts during further technical workshops and drafted uh, the guidelines. And we are so, so happy. They are really considered in the health and framework and are now included in the health and monitoring guidelines. And you see the front pages of these two guidelines, very, very nice and so on. And I'm so happy and a bit proud of our network as well that we really accomplished that. That was really huge stuff. Concerning the data collection, we did some literature study and also um, yeah, conducted, um, 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 went to the Embednet database and so on. Uh, but what we really identified is that there is a huge lack of data, especially for seabed sediments, but also for microbes in the water column. But of course, we hope that this will improve now uh, with existing guidelines and more data coming in and so on. We really have a basis for baselines and do the thresholds uh, on that. Concerning the prerequisites, um, these were identified based on the guidelines. So what is in the guidelines? What is the necessity for future monitoring when, when it's not yet established or uh, to adopt, adapt and establish? Uh, but also we identified in the la latest uh, workshop in December 2022 that there are still um, major hindrances for monitoring of microlithics. And these were mainly based on um, yeah, uh, management structures or specific resources. And still there is a lacking um, in, in research advances concerning especially um, representativeness of stations and so on. So this is the draft document that is based um, and will receive some further comments and will be included in the final, in the final document as well. Then we carried out two screening studies, first of all, on real environmental samples from seabed sediments and along the German coastline. So we have, you see here, the sampling stations, uh, which are in a transect within the major estuaries in, in Germany. And we also included three stations in the EEZ. Um, and we, what we see is um, that we have a decreasing uh, uh, concentration with increasing distance to the shoreline which is not new in the literature and which is reported uh, via several studies, but this also gives me some confidence in the monitoring again, because we all always were wondering, can we be representative when we investigate, for example, seabed sediment, or even more, um, yeah, more difficult probably in, in surface waters in the water column. And this kind of pattern gives me some confidence that it could really work out, but of course we need some um, more um, more data in, uh, in terms of uh, time series and so on and so on. So this is the one sampling uh, method. And what is also supported, uh, we also carried out um, um, comparative analysis within one sample or at one station, and these are quite close together. So it's not a major uh, difference within uh, if you if you carry um, if you um, investigate three times the same sample or something like that. And um, looks quite. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, surprising, but it looks good. And then um, our um, Geva um, and Martha from Latvia, they carried out this literature study on this, um, the water column, which is mainly based on manta drawing. And we see that the concentrations here, they vary a lot, but this is mainly um, due to different sampling methods and concerning manta draws, also different mass sizes and so on. And of course, the current, the new monitoring um, guidelines will certainly increase here the, the comparability of, of data. To summarize uh, these results, well, we have evaluated uh, the current approaches and we have them also updated um, um, lately in December. So we have 
compiled information for all Helcom countries, have them updated, and it provides us like a monitoring for the monitoring strategies. So we can come back to that and um, look what has changed um, within due to the Helcom use output, probably to the, to the guidelines or what is currently um, really developed in different countries. Concerning the guidelines, they have been accomplished and are now included. And it's um, yeah, it's, it's such a small sentence, but it's, it's a huge effort, and I'm very very happy. And uh, I would like to very much thank all the uh, the experts provided input here. That was really valuable. Concerning the data, well, that's probably the the, the only set of parts, but that will improve. We really identified this lack of comparable data that are published. But I'm quite aware that a lot of countries are currently undertaking other efforts within for monitoring, also for, for research, but these data are not yet available. Uh, that gives us, again, the necessity of also providing data, for example, to MOSNET. Then concerning the specification of prerequisites, we have identified these prerequisites, but also the major hindrances, and that is going yeah, together. So one identifies the others, and that is a really struggle that has to be solved in the quite near future if we really want to accomplish uh, the monitoring. Concerning the screening studies, well, at least it gave us the hint, lack of data, but it gave us uh, also some confidence that the guidelines are validated. They can be carried out like this, and it works, and we have some more data in a quite good resolution, at least for uh, the sediment at the German coast right now. For well, some key messages for, for the science. Um, well, what we identified is that there is still need for further discussion. So uh, that is ongoing in OSPAR as well as in, in CCML and um, in HELCOM as well, especially in terms of the selection of monitoring stations. That probably refers to that most of the monitoring stations are selected in accordance with other monitoring programs, such as uh, contaminants and feeder sediments or something like that which is a good one, but probably we have to rethink whether it's a good one for micro litter in the sediments or in the water column. And we will also need to discuss and revisit some positions concerning um, quality assurance um, uh, measures and so on within the sampling processing and the data reporting. That is because the guidelines now, they do not provide one single recipe. So you, you cannot follow a you take so, um, such a volume of a sample and you add these chemicals and so on, but it provides some flexibility. So all of the countries are able to carry out the monitoring, but the flexibility needs to be backed up with a precise UHC. So we can really say, okay, we have these, these recovery rates and we can prove that our method is working as well. That's the only thing how it works um, so far. And that's the same. Um, and quite in harmony with the current OSPAR approaches which is, um, in the drafting and the drafting um, 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 yeah, um, status as well, as well as in the PGML. It's the same situation and very much in harmony. Elke, sorry to interrupt, one minute left. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying up. Um, so we have this lack of research findings, which I mentioned already concerning spatial and temporal representativeness, and we saw the findings from the screening study. For policy maker, uh, uh, makers, it's uh, really the first and single one is, is very important. We identify these major, major hindrances. So logistics resources that have to be really dissolved. Um, and what we also identified, and I think what we all would support, strongly support, that cooperation between countries, especially concerning sampling campaigns and laboratory analysis, be further evaluated because some countries do not have the necessary device or there is a lack of research vessel or something like that. And of course, additional efforts, and that's the link to science, has to be made to support the monitoring strategies by a scientific process. Use of results so far. Okay, we have new monitoring guidelines that the major use uh, for now and for the future. Uh, we also address the water reaction plan, of course. Within NSSC, that supports, uh, again, um, the first number 10, specifically P10, P2. And I'm very happy that uh, PG litter is made of part of the health monitoring guidance are included in the current draft of the NSSC guidance sector on micro litter, which is under review and under comment. 
For data, uh, we would like to very much thank the Helcom Expert Group and Marine Lisa, and especially the national experts who provided valuable input and the state agencies and offices on the, from the federal uh, states of uh, Germany, from Mecklenburg, Western, uh, Mecklenburg, Western, Pomerania, and uh, Hitler, Holstein, who supported the sampling uh, of the Cedar sediment sample. Output, we have the guidelines again and again. Uh, two of them, and um, the major results on the screening studies were also um, introduced at the latest MIPO 2022 conference by Laura Post, and um, you can find the link. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elke. Um, I mean, it's clear by your presentation that in this field, there's quite a lot that still needs to be developed to ensure that we have good monitoring, good assessments. Um, it's clear that there's difference between the sediment and the water column. And so you're saying that monitoring stations is something that's lacking or that we're using this for other reasons that maybe doesn't always necessarily apply for a specifically micro litter. So having the chance now in this conference with all the scientists and everyone else is here, what would be your plea in terms of making sure or ensuring that this cooperation strengthens between the countries, because that's obviously what we need uh, in this area. So what would be your sort of priority or plea that needs to happen? Well, if I come to my plea, I would I would suggest that the strong co cooperation, and so that probably one or two or three laboratories can cover the analysis for other countries as well, but that's a logistic thing we probably cannot solve. But uh, within the national group, we really Said, okay, um, that would be the best way to do. But um, I think it's clearly a, a lack of resources as well. That's not a lack of willingness of especially the researchers or the, the persons being in charge for that, but uh, it's a clear lack of management structures and resources on that. To set up a new indicator and to set up a new, a new sampling contain approach that is really expensive, especially for water column, where you need a lot of cooking time and so on. And uh, since we do not know how really the spatial distribution of microplastics is, um, is it really related to contaminants or is it completely different? Is it uh, based on on uh, um, uh, sea currents or is it um, um, related to sources and so on? And therefore, within the guidelines, we also said, okay, let's, um, the, the best thing and it's a recommendation within the guidelines is to have like stations where we monitor related potential sources which are more close to the coastline and to have like like an archive monitoring in outer sea regions where we see okay is there an accumulation over time but that's a recommendation which is included now here and is also included in the tdml monitoring um, recommendations right now great thank you very much elke um, we're going to move now to another topic, and I'm glad that Johanna has put her screen back on because I thought we would do a little energizer to sort of break this session um, and uh, go into our next one. So, Johanna, can you give us a bit of uh, exercise that we need, just a little short one to get people back um, into uh, the next session? <laughs> um, absolutely. Um... I'm just trying to get my own view here. Yes. So we need to get the blood circulating a bit, right? So please stand up, everyone. If you can, you can also close your cameras. I'm not offended, but uh, <laughs> if you feel a bit shy for everyone to see. So stand up, raise your arms, stretch on your left, on your right, you're like a seaweed in the bottom. You can, you know, even make a little bit of a big wave underneath. Then put your arms uh, to the back and to the front, like you're a great beacon showing all the ships where to go. And finally, you can do some wrist work. This could be like the biggest storm of January in a microscopic scale. Great. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you, Johanna. Now we've got the, the blood flowing again uh, and ready for going deep diving into the next topic, 
which is um, which is underwater noise. Um, so this is the activity four of the Project Blues um, package. Uh, and this is something that I think we know that there is continually sounds underwater, uh, natural sounds. We have waves, wind, ice, thunderstorms that you know the marine flora and fauna are used to. However, it's become more and more evident, thanks to research, that human activities cause additional sounds which are really impacting the marine environment. And typically, this could be activities from infrastructure, you know, cables, um, building of bridges, etc. And it can also be deliberately uh, by using eco sounders, sonars, seismic air guns, for example. And Helcom has developed a monitoring method for underwater noise and have also agreed together with all the contracting parties that sound shouldn't have a negative impact on marine life. So quite a challenge to have this sort of agreed goal. And so we will hear a little bit more about this today in terms of the sort of results and indicators. Uh, we have two presenters. <clears throat> if you can go to the next slide, yeah. Two presenters that will be tackling two types of underwater noise. We have continuous noise and we have impulsive noise. Um, so the first speaker, uh, which is Alexander Clausen, who is a professor at the Tallinn University of Technology, heading the research group on underwater acoustics. He's also a member of the Helcom expert group on underwater noise and the EU technical group on underwater noise, as well as leading, of course, in this Blues project, the noise activity um, thematic. So with that, Alexander, uh, I give the virtual floor to you to present on continuous noise. Thank you, Otilia. So I will start with um, just a moment. Let us know if you want us to help you with setting up a presentation on our end. No, no, I, I think I, I can do it. Is it okay now? Can you see my screen? Nope, we see no, nothing. Okay, okay. Just a moment. Good. We have a cliffhanger here. We're waiting in impatience, Alexander, for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just, uh... Otherwise, Johanna can probably put it up for you. Because, yes, just a moment. Sure. Can you see my blue screen? Yes, we see your desktop now. And? Yes, here we go. Okay, okay. Perfect. So I will start with my presentation on continuous noise. And uh, so we were partners here in this, in this task with uh, Helcom. And uh, with the help of our subcontractors and with uh, enormous support from Helcom Expert Group, on underwater noise, and especially Jakob Tugart, who has contributed quite a lot in this in success of this task. So our deliverables are production of new soundscape maps of the Baltic Sea, and uh, developing and execution of assessment of noise sensitive species in, in the Baltic Sea, as well as improvement of calibration standards. So this third task is aiming to improve uh, uh, monitoring quality of the underwater sound in general. And so uh, our task, so we do our assessment by uh, sub-buses in the Baltic Sea. And uh, for the modeling, we have chosen the year 2018 as we had the better, best coverage of uh, monitoring data for this period. And uh, before I start with the maps, uh, I want to present you some metrics of soundscape maps. 
So we have a timeline here on the horizontal axis and we have natural sound. So as uh, Otilia talked just before, so it is um, mainly uh, because of wind and, and waves. And uh, in our observation point or in, in our monitoring point, once the ship is approaching, we have emerging of underwater sound, which is shown here in red. And we have excess of anthropogenic sound above natural sound. And we have total sound pressure, which is sum of natural and anthropogenic sound. So further, I will use this terminology. So total meaning it includes total, uh, include natural and anthropogenic as well. And excess is just uh, what is above natural sound. Uh, also in underwater sound, we have uh, another axis, which is frequency. And uh, we need to choose uh, frequencies which are uh, suitable for different species. For example, fish is hearing and uh, sensing uh, underwater sound in low frequencies. So we have chosen 125 Hertz uh, decidicate frequency band for fishes. And for marine mammals, it is obviously high frequency. It was chosen in this study as 500 Hertz decidicate. Now here you can see the results of modeling for the Baltic Sea. To the left, you can see median of total sound pressure level, and to the right, median excess level for 125 Hertz. So it is a low frequency and shipping noise is contributing quite a lot in this particular frequency band. What we see is that these two pictures are not too much different, meaning that underwater sound and this frequency propagating is very well. It's, it is well spread over the Baltic Sea. If you go to the high frequencies, it is not the same. So high frequencies are propagating less well. They are mainly concentrated around shipping lanes. So here we consider only shipping noise. And so once again, on the left is total sound pressure level. And on the right is excess level or dominance. So meaning that this is a sound pressure which is presented uh, for half of the time in any monitoring and modeling point. Next, as we have our soundscape maps ready, we will proceed to assessment of, uh, of the marine um, species. And here for indicator species, we have fish and we have marine mammals, gray seal or like representative of all seals because in every part of the Baltic Sea, you have at least one species of seal. Uh, Harbor Polpus also, it is also, so we know that it is only limited to this southern part of the Baltic Sea. And for fishes, so Baltic herring, which is quite sensitive to sound and cod. Uh, now for the effects, so levels of onset of biologically significant adverse effects. So what is uh, acceptable, what is not acceptable for animals. So if we talk about total natural anthropogenic sound, it is producing disturbance, meaning that animals want to flee from this place. They want to avoid uh, in some way a uh, source of noise. As for excess, it is mainly producing masking, which is hindering communication of animals and perception of uh, uh, fish or whatever. So this is another issue. So these two are particularly uh, issues of continuous noise. So what is acceptable here is uh, in this table, uh, you can see that uh, we have some way simplified this problem. So all marine mammals are uh, assessed in 500 Hertz subductive band or DC decade and uh, the SPL, which is acceptable for disturbance, is 110 decibels. As for dominance, it is 20 decibels above natural sound. For fish, we are going down in frequency, so it's 125 hertz, and acceptable is same number, it's 110 hertz 
uh, uh, so, sorry, 110 decibels and 20 dB of uh, excess level or, or, or um, dominance is for disturbance. Okay, next our criteria. Uh, we have two criteria here in this uh, assessment. So first is for disturbance. For disturbance, let's have a marine area. And in this marine area, we have one part of this marine area which is affected by shipping noise. This is total noise. And if this, this noise can exceed lobe or this acceptable decibel value. If a marine area affected is less than 20%, it is GS. If it is more than 20%, it is not GS. Similarly, for uh, masking or for excess level, uh, so uh, we can access, we can, uh, we can uh, exceed lobe value for 20% of area. If it is more than 20, it is not GS. If it is less, it is GS. And to be in GS, we need to uh, satisfy both criteria. Now here is a result by some selected sub -buses. On the up is, uh, uh, so um, uh, you see 125 Hertz, so the top band and 500 Hertz in the bottom. Uh, on the horizontal line is uh, months, so year by months, and on the vertical is percentage of area affected. So as can you see for disturbance, none is, is affected. And even if we take, for example, 500 Hertz, you can see nothing. So practically uh, such SPL value is not happen for half of the time. It can be presented for smaller fraction of time, but for half of the time, it is not uh, present. If we go to dominance, dominance 20 dB for both 125 and 500 Hertz, we see that for 500 Hertz, it happened, but it never attained 20%. As for low frequency 125, we have a lot of basins in which for some months of the year, this threshold is exceeded. Of course, uh, 500 Hertz is not visible. So we, we cannot, we do not exceed a threshold for 500, but it is of course, depends on our dominance, which was chosen 20 dB. In case we take it lower, it will be present, but it should be uh, further discussed how to proceed with this. 500 Hertz value or frequency band. And this is an overview of what we have for all basins here for marine mammals and fishes. So what we see is that for, for fishes, quite a lot of basins, uh, we are not in GS, but for marine mammals, it looks better. It is green. And this is overview on the map. So, uh, Results, uh, we have new soundscape maps that they can be found on ISIS website. We have made assessment. And so we see, so assessment for fish and for marine mammals in the Baltic Sea. We have held uh, online workshop on, on uh, calibration standards as well. And my key messages here is, uh, so we need to know more about the effects of continuous noise on marine species. And uh, we need to elaborate further GS criteria uh, based on improved knowledge on the effects of continual noise on uh, marine species. And a uh, key message for policymakers, so low frequency ship traffic noise can adversely affect fish and uh, care should be taken to avoid disturbance on the known spawning grounds. And the use of results of our uh, research in HELCOM as part of HOLA 3 and pre core indicator in uh, Baltic Sea action plan. So we contributing in some actions of this plan on the level on uh, MSFD. So we are reporting on uh, uh, D11. And uh, on the level of EU, so we are continuing cooperation with DG noise. 
And finally, so this work was possible due to support from Helcom expert group on underwater And so special thanks for to Jakob Tuber, uh, who is a, le a leader of this expert group. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexander. What an interesting presentation. So we understood that there are two types of criteria, as you mentioned, the avoidance behavior and then the masking. Um, and, and it was interesting to see sort of the months uh, implications of the, the different um, hertz level decibels, where you said that the 500 you couldn't always see, where it wasn't present enough for it to come on the um, these scales. But I guess I, I'm, I have a question, sort of what does that mean in terms of implications as a pressure for animals? I mean, this activity, is it linked? You mentioned a little bit at the end that is there a correlation that you can see depending on the activity that is, what it could be for activity, and also what that could have for impact depending on animals' behavior. So you 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 meant spawning grounds or reproduction. You know, is do you see any correlation here that could be a clear sort of policy um, ask or area to to focus more on? Uh, yes. Uh, so for sure, we see that uh, continuous noise is affecting marine marine biota, and of course, it is low frequency as it is generated by ships. And so probably marine mammals are really not much affected by it. But it doesn't mean because as it affects fishes, so I suppose that indirectly it is also, it might also affect marine mammals if we have some effects on fishes. But of course we need more work, I think, to, to better understand what is happening on the, this is like general assessment of the Baltic Sea, but of course, case by case, we need to look in some particular area, spawning grounds, for example, what's happening with cod spawning grounds in the southern Baltic Sea, for example, when we have a lot of shipping noise. And we know also that cod is communicating in low frequencies, so it is especially important for, for them. Yeah, so I think, yes, there is a lot of questions to, uh, to address here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and following up on this question, uh, there is, there's one that's been raised here in the chat is if you could elaborate on the decision of why it was used 20 decibels as the excess level. And could this make sense to model this with lower levels such as 15 or 12 decibels um, because maybe 20 decibels might seem high? Uh, uh, this is, yes, this is an open question because we have taken 20 because 20, for half of the time, 20 dB is huge. So we are sure that if we have 20 dB, we have uh, features with masking. If we go down, uh, we are not so sure. But of course, it, it's a matter of uh, research because not enough research is done in this area, in this in this field. So we need more because the research from laboratory and what is happening in nature is quite different things. But hopefully, we need. Uh, so we need more data about uh, behavior reaction and about masking in natural conditions. Great. Um, there's a few more questions, I think, on, on this sort of uh, decibel questions. And maybe that's something that you can address um, in the chat, because I think we need to move on. But I think I just want to allude to one comment that's come up from the European Union um, that it's important to mention that this work is closely interlinked with the discussions within the technical group for noise, uh, which has led to the recent adoption of an EU threshold values for underwater noise. And this supports, of course, Helcom, but will also be key in the future for concrete implementation of the EU thresholds values and for the assessment of the state of the Baltic Sea area. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, but but please, Alexander, I would really uh, appreciate it if you could answer some of the questions that are in the chat. There's quite a few. Um, so you've obviously raised a few interests. So well done and, and an interesting topic for sure. So moving on then to the other uh, section of this activity, which is looking at impulsive noise. And here we have the pleasure of Mirko Mustonen 
who will be presenting on this. Um, he is a researcher also at the Tallinn University of Technology in the research group on underwater acoustics and has been working with this topic for over a decade and has participated specifically in this activity of underwater noise in the Blues project. So Mirko, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hello from my side. So uh, I will share my screen. No. So can you sh see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, so now you can see my side also. Sure. Okay. So hello to everybody. Uh, uh, and I was responsible for giving this presentation about the impulsive noise part uh, in activity four. Um, and the uh, subtasks uh, for impulsive noise were to improve the register for impulsive noise events uh, and then to develop and execute uh, a new assessment method for uh, impulsive noise. Um, uh, and, and first, uh, the first kind of um, task was, uh, was uh, achieved by uh, um, composing this doc document for uh, that um, uh, analyzed uh, what is actually inside the current ICES impulsive noise uh, events registry and also to uh, understand what can be uh, improved and to propose a number of, uh, of uh, ideas uh, for improvement inside this uh, registry. And after some uh, discussions, uh, a number of uh, changes were, were implemented and um, new reporting format actually is avail available as of um, January 2023. Uh, so here you can see that um, uh, like inside this um, reporting format, the changes that uh, were made uh, during December last year uh, so they're actually quite new, uh, so it actually took a lot of time for discussions what to change and uh, what, what changes can be made and uh, what changes are actually reasonable and, and so on. So uh, not all kind of recommendations were taken into account, but um, uh, this is understandable. And uh, uh, although the one thing is that the changes ha are relatively recent and uh, some kind of revisions might be required here. So uh, we had a uh, lot of discussions with the ISIS um, team and, um, and uh, Neil Holsworth and uh, Carlos Pinto and, and uh, Joana Ribeiro and, and all the kind of people we actually discussed things with uh, our uh, greatly appreciated here. Uh, they really helped their work uh, forward. Uh, another and a bigger kind of part of the, the of the work was to develop and execute the assessment method for for the impulsive noise, uh, and uh, the indicator was uh, based on the distribution in time and space of uh, loud, uh, low and mid frequency impulsive sounds. So this work was uh, led actually by Karina Jurecek and, uh, and a lot of uh, other people uh, who will be thanked uh, by name a bit later. Uh, and um, the indicator that was developed was also used for, for the assessment of the Helcom C area. So the input data is actually uh, originates from the registry that uh, we uh, also improved, um, although the improvements weren't uh, inside the registry for, for this assessment. Uh, so uh, the uh, registry contains all uh, air gun array uses, explosions, uh, uh, impact pile driver uses, uh, and, uh, and other impulsive noise events that uh, take place in the Baltic Sea and, and uh, all the countries are kind of uh, responsible for actually reporting uh, all these things into this registry. 
And this is the kind of two maps showing the overview of, uh, of the input data that went into the uh, assessment. Uh, so this data was actually used for uh, uh, to model, like uh, we know where some sort of event took place. And uh, from uh, and we also know the kind of what the density event it was. And we can do some modeling to, to kind of uh, uh, assess what uh, size area actually was affected by the impulse in noise. Uh, and yeah, what 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 uh, area was affected by the by the by this uh, certain event and what at what time. Uh, and from that, uh, we can uh, uh, this knowledge, we can uh, kind of develop a couple of um, uh, Thresholds, threshold values, and uh, the threshold values here are twofold. So there is this uh, really like short, short term uh, daily uh, exposed area. So the daily uh, exposed area uh, uh, should be below 20% uh, of, uh, of the habitat fraction. And if the daily habitat uh, fraction uh, area is below daily, uh, it is below 20%, then the uh, threshold is, is uh, not exceeded. But there is also this long-term uh, threshold uh, value that is like uh, annual daily averages uh, should be below uh, 10%. So uh, here you can also see the, the assessment was done for the time period of uh, 2016 to 2021, and here you see the annual um, uh, daily averages uh, over the years. So uh, they were below, uh, well below 10%. Uh, so 2016, 1.18, and, and so on. So the highest one was uh, 2.77 for 2019. And here's, here you can also see these daily values uh, and uh, the, like the proportion of, uh, of habitat uh, that was actually uh, 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 where, where the uh, proportion of habitat that was affected by different, um, uh, different uh, event types and also uh, overall proportion what, here in, in red dots. So you can see that uh, this is for year 2016. So the daily number never actually exceeded 20% for 2016. Yeah. And also actually the, the, the species that we're looking here is, uh, is harbor purpose. That's, this is also that we must kind of uh, say here. So the the species uh, whose habitat is actually uh, we're, we're following here is harper porpoise. So this was the main result that um, uh, for all of the Baltic Sea, the, the threshold values uh, for impulsive noise were not exceeded. So uh, both of the threshold values were not, not exceeded. The daily uh, habitat fraction was uh, always below, well below 20%, and the uh, annual average is uh, also uh, below 10%. Um, but uh, here are some uh, caveats, actually. The reporting completeness is uh, one uh, kind of uh, question that uh, we must kind of address here, is that, uh, that not all countries and uh, reports uh, events uh, as uh, well as uh, some other countries. So uh, uh, the actual data that was used here uh, might not be complete. Um, although also pile driving and air guns, uh, these probably were uh, the most loud kind of uh, uh, things that take place in our, uh, uh, in our seas in impulsive noise terms. Uh, these were probably still reported uh, uh, as they kind of happen. And yes, uh, these were the results. So uh, the, uh, there is an improved version of, uh, of reporting uh, format to the, to the uh, 
register of impulsive noise events uh, that is now uh, available. And also the new uh, um, indicator for the assessment was developed and then also used for, for this uh, assessment uh, in the help from C area. So some key messages for uh, science. Uh, well, first key message is that uh, the assessments were only done for Harvard purpose. Uh, maybe some more effect uh, studies of uh, impulsive noise on other species beside, beside the Harvard purpose uh, should be uh, studied um, in the future. So uh, the impulsive noise also the kind of assessment uh, should be maybe in the future done to other species as well uh, and also the some further improvements to the to the assessment methods uh, might be required in the future so it's still a new method or a new new assessment method so uh, some some studies or room for improvement probably uh, exist for policymakers, uh, the reporting to the ISIS uh, impulsive noise registry has to be improved. So some countries actually don't uh, report things to this registry at all, and some other countries only report things partially to there. Also, legislation regarding the impulsive noise um, producing activities should be developed and harmonized for Helcom countries and actually moving forward in this field is uh, very urgent because uh, new offshore wind developments uh, are on their way in uh, most of the Baltic Sea countries I guess so uh, this is something that we need to do fast because pile driving will maybe become a big issue in the future uh, in, in this field. And also the, the, these uh, results uh, will be used in HELCOM level for uh, uh, as an updated pre-core indicator reports um, uh, in HALAS 3. Um, Baltic Sea uh, action plan, uh, uh, this uh, also contributes to, to various actions, actions here uh, in MSFT, uh, uh, it's also um, contributes in MSFT and also there is a lot of uh, cooperation with uh, GG Noise that actually uh, help to put us put this whole thing together. And also this work uh, would not have been possible without uh, really a lot of uh, input from uh, from various other people. So um, uh, Elcom expert group on underwater noise, of course. Um, uh, also, all, all the people that actually composed the uh, uh, impulsive noise uh, uh, assessment method and, and uh, carried it out actually. So, Karina Juracek, Katarina Grunert, Ramona Egenman, Benedikt Niesterok, Isabella Gratzer, Maria Bodling, Jakob Tugard, Okotin, and Matthias Andersen, and Emilia Lalander, and uh, I guess also the ISIS team I already thanked before. Uh, so this is it from my side. Uh, Great, but... thank you very much, Mirko. Uh, we have uh, uh, a question that's come in for you. Um, that is looking at: Can you elaborate on the reason of using twenty percent area approach? Because we know that several of the events in these area or these areas uh, of animals that were killed were due to impulsive noise events. Uh, explosions, and even maybe the event affected less than 20% of this area. So could you, um, could this be taken into account in the assessment? Sorry, I may have read this a little bit wrong. Uh, well, it, uh, I, I guess it was uh, like 20% uh, 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 I don't actually remember why why it was twenty percent uh, <laughs> was chosen for that because I was not uh, kind of uh, intimately involved in the choice of this twenty percent. But I guess it's like uh, still um, like population level effects that were kind of considered here. So if only twenty percent of the population is somehow affected, then 
uh, then uh, then uh, things are still fine for the population. And I guess also that uh, they didn't kind of think that uh, for some really acute effects uh, might occur. Uh, so like they didn't take into account like the uh, death occurring for the animals actually. Mm. So, uh, I don't know. Okay. So maybe so maybe there should be in the future some uh, some other kind of level that if you have uh, levels that are so high that uh, animals actually get killed, then uh, this should be taken into account in some other way. Mm. So that that okay. what I might think at least that okay, was the case for the twenty percent. And and just one last question before we move on. Uh, there's a comment here that I think it's awkward or strange that both types of sources that we've listened to these presentation allow for 40% of the Baltic Sea area affected by continuous noise or impulsive noise, and that this still would be good environmental status. Not having looked at continuous noise contributions from recreational boats and also missing military, so impulsive sources like military. So do the results that, that show all green really tell managers, policymakers that no additional mitigation measures are needed? So this is really kind of questioning whether the, the data you have now really can say that it's not. Um, well, I think it, uh, this is like. Uh, uh, a lot better assessment than was does, uh, than was done uh, in previous Holas assessment, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think there are, are like still a lot of room for improvement and discussion now. Actually, uh, what might be done uh, even better next time, and uh, all the critique I think is uh, is uh, justified, but uh, it needs some kind of uh, <laughs> like really a discussion by scientists now. What uh, what uh, how do they kind of uh, how can we make this thing better still? Whether it gives now a wrong kind of picture to the uh, to the legislative uh, people, I don't know. Uh, uh, in a way, may maybe yes, but uh, to give it like a if if the result would have been that everything is red, like everything is bad, then I, I think this might also have been like a wrong a message <laughs> to give. So uh, I, I think this is an interesting topic, and I see that uh, we have um, Alexander raising your hand, and I'm assuming that's a direct kind of response to this. So if you could just make it short, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, come in yes. here. Yes, uh, just I want to say that uh, as we are assessing Baltic Sea, so it's a huge area, and that's why this is, even this impulsive noise based on this big area, its percentage of area affected is is small. So here is a, is a problem, I think, because we need to assess something which is very huge based on very local effects of which is producing by sound. And that's why we, we can have these results which might seem contradictory. So it's green because it is like 80% uh, of area is not affected or even more. So maybe yeah. um, by, by, by clustering all together, you kind of lose yeah. this nuance that it needs to maybe be on a more local level. Yes, it, it's a question of, of choice of assessment area. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that explanation. And I just want to loop back in because we have from the Health Home Secretary, Marta Ruiz, who is just saying that uh, to please remind you that Health Home is committed to work and address underwater noise and is doing this through the Regional Action Plan on Underwater Noise. So I'm sure a lot of these discussions will be brought into this as well from the results from this report. So we have actually gone through the sort of first bulk uh, morning session, and we are now going to break for um, a bit less than an hour's lunch. And as you know, so welcome back. Uh, we are now moving into the last of our four thematic activities of the Baltic Blue Project, um, which is on the effectiveness uh, or efficiency and measures. So this is raising it up you know, to a, a larger level, I would say, or higher level than these specific sort of thematic areas that we've had. Um, to start us off and uh, helps me in terms of not explaining this area so much because it's quite a broad, broad area. We have a, a video 
um, that will showcase a little bit, a nice introduction to this theme where we will have two presenters um, come in. And so this really is an area where we focus on setting an assessment framework for the regional level uh, analysis of the Baltic Sea. And what I think could be interesting for a lot of people here when listening to these presentations is maybe also thinking, how could this be applied more generally as methods and tools for other marine areas? I mean, we are very much focused on the Baltic Sea, HELCOMS uh, assessments, but this is also to feed into the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, but could be also broader in teaching and learnings that could be used here for other marine waters further afield. So I'll uh, tap on Jana to help me here, who will introduce the second video, uh, which will give us a nice background moving into this uh, last of the activity sessions. Jana. Yes, thank you very much, Otilia. So as mentioned now, after the lunch break, we will switch topics from indicators to the economic and social analysis. And uh, this was one of the largest activities of the Helcom Blues project, actually. And it's an increasingly important part also of the regional work. And that's why we chose this as the topic for the second of our project uh, videos. And again, it will be made available on the project website and is tended, uh, intended for further use also after the project time life. And uh, it's again a short video of about one and a half minutes and uh, I will play it now. So enjoy. Preserving a healthy ecosystem is important. In fact, our life depends on it. We need to fully understand the overall balance between the many ways our societies benefit from the Baltic Sea and the negative impact these activities have on the ecosystem. Some of the essential questions that the economic and social analyses by Helcom aim to answer are Who uses the sea? For what purpose and to what degree? What effect do these activities have on the environment? And what is the impact to our societies? For example, coastal tourism employs 143,000 people in the Baltic Sea region and it provides recreational experiences to us valued at 35 billion euros per year. Degradation caused by our actions diminishes the value of these benefits and can also be analysed. We must find a balance between the value we extract from the environment and the negative impact we cause. The stakes are high. People's livelihoods, culture and well-being are all directly affected by the state of the environment. It is therefore crucial to counteract negative impacts on the marine environment with the right actions and measures. The analyses support decision-making in pinpointing the biggest benefits for the marine environment as well as the human society. This gives us a better chance to chart a sustainable path to the balance we need to achieve to enjoy the benefits the marine environment provides now and for future generations. Preserving a healthy... Yes, and that was the new ESA video premiere. And with this short introduction to the theme, I hand back over to Otilia again. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Um, yes, so in this activity, which is called Activity 1, uh, we will have two presenters sort of shifting uh, between the presentations. Um, and as we, as we said, this is really tackling um, the sort of socio-economic analysis. So looking more about what has this impact for us, not just the environment, but impact for us in balancing the benefits we get, but also the impacts to nature. And this is really to look at how we can support regional measures and policies. And there will be a lot of subtasks. So I don't know, Johanna, if you want to put the slide on with all the subtasks, just so we get an idea. Um, this, this will be a longer presentation uh, with, with a lot of varied <clears throat> topics um, that will be shared by the two presenters, Antti Ijo and Luke Dodd. And you can see there's sort of four main um, activity or task areas. So looking at the development of the assessment framework, the improved data for the assessment, Estimations on the benefits as well then on the economic effectiveness of policies and measures and policy support. And under this, there's an additional number of subtasks 
Um, so without further ado, I want to present both speakers. We will have first from Antti Iho, who is a senior scientist from the Natural Resource Institute in Finland called Lukke, uh, leads the activity on effectiveness of measures in the Blues project, has done research in environmental policy, specifically on nutrient loading in agriculture, and is currently working on applying the Dasgupta review to the Finnish societal landscape. And uh, his partner in crime for the presentation today is Luke Dodd, who is a project researcher at Helcom, who is liaising on this activity for Helcom Blues. And he manages the expert group on social and economic analysis and has previously been involved in many EU co-funded projects such as Action and Pan Baltic Scope for Helcom. So I will leave the floor to both of you to see how you will want to set this up. And maybe um, halfway through the presentation, we might do a, a, a short stop. Maybe you can indicate to me where you feel best and maybe we can get some questions from the audience and so we can have a bit of interaction through this session. So please, Antti and Luke. Thank you, Otilia. I'll, uh, if you allow me to share the screen. Uh, So, and Luke will be the one to start. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take the first. Slide. So just indicate when, when I should uh, switch the slide. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll take the first ones of these. Um, so uh, the, the task we're already introduced, so we can jump to uh, straight in. So this was, uh, I, I guess, first thing I should say is that a lot of these early tasks everything built up to the task 1.4. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes uh, in tasks one, two, and three that we won't dive into um, because you can see the outcomes at the end. Uh, but uh, 1.1 focused on developing this assessment framework, which you can see here, <clears throat> the arrows and, and rectangles in black were parts that were developed under the previous action project and these pink pieces are expansions uh, and refinements that were conducted under blues or developed under blues uh, as part of also as part of this uh, well actually maybe maybe not um, anyway most of 1.1 happened by the scenes. Ante, can you? Uh, uh, 1.2 uh, focused on improving data for for the assessment, primarily for um, costs and for effectiveness of measures. Uh, so this was new expert surveys for marine mammals, zooplankton, new literature review and data integration approaches for marine mammals and water birds. There's some uh, help that, or there's some data linking nutrient inputs to eutrophication states, which was uh, generously provided by um, Bo Gustafson, who did some dedicated model runs of Baltzum for us. And uh, then finally the marine litter abatement cost database Next slide. <clears throat> then uh, 1.3 focused on estimation of, of benefits, environmental benefits. Um, so this included uh, updating uh, the uh, literature review of uh, benefit estimate studies from published literature, gray literature. And this work got a, a big uh, help from uh, the Bonus Rosemary project, who who shared some pre-publish uh, work that that they did on a similar uh, on the same topic, and we were able to update that and and uh, move that move that work forward as well. Then uh, this activity was also. Uh, in charge of generating the benefit estimates from for each uh, uh, country that we had data for, and then also uh, extrapolating those 
uh, data onto countries with, without um, primary valuation studies using value transfer methods. Uh, then we get into sort of the results oriented uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, the activity. And this is 1.4.1, which uh, conducted the use of marine waters analysis, which will show in, uh, will be part of Hollis 3. It's a chapter in Hollis 3. So the we completed the use of marine waters for a variety of topics, but um, perhaps most, uh, excuse me, Uh, the um, renewable energy generation, we were able to expand to include uh, economic data for the first time and extraction uh, and new, completely new uh, um, topics of extraction of oil and gas, extraction of minerals, and waste treatment and disposal. On the uh, we have an example of this. Uh, our tourism and leisure, which you can see here. So these are uh, data, I believe they all came from Eurostat, where which compiles a variety of data on um, tourism stats. This, unlike some sectors where you can have very clear counts and very clear relationships between two different, you know, the, the activity and, and its outputs, say something like shipping, you can measure the tons shipped. Tourism is more difficult because uh, there's no, there's nobody at, at the public beach with a, with a counter. Uh, but in, as a proxy, we can work with this uh, number of nights spent in tourist accommodation establishments in coastal areas. Um, and you can uh, then link that to uh, number of persons employed and value added and things like that. Uh, the downside to this statistic is that it is heavily impacted by coastal cities where obviously mm -hmm. not all hotel stays are tourism related. But nevertheless, you can see very high contributions uh, for uh, some of these, some of the Helcom countries, typically the highest uh, <clears throat> percentage countries have uh, major coastal cities. So we're looking at, at Tallinn and Copenhagen and uh, Riga, where you're not, where you're having uh, non-tourism stay inflate the numbers. But nevertheless, it's a huge, it's a very large sector, employs almost 150,000 people and six, six and a half billion uh, in value added. Auntie. Um, so then uh, 1.4.2 is the sufficiency and efficiency of measures analysis. And the aim is to uh, carry out an improved version of the analyses that were uh, implemented by Action Project. Uh, that work is continuing to progress, but uh, the code development has been, has, as, as frequently happens, uh, underestimated. And uh, the work's ongoing, but we expect to have a minimal viable version uh, next week. I think this is where I hand it off to you. Thank you, Luke. So, uh, hello, um, I'm Antio from, uh, from Natural Resources Institute, Finland. Just a, a few general uh, remarks on, uh, on the, uh, maybe the difference of uh, economic and social analysis uh, compared to the natural scientific results that we've been uh, listening uh, today. So part of the uh, results 
from the economic and social analysis are clear cut. They they can be presented represented as as numbers like like we do here. But the closer we get to the decision making progress, the more careful we have to be uh, on the uh, on the frameworks, on the decision making frameworks that we use, and on the on the complexity of stuff that starts coming in when we make the decisions because there's not it's it's never single dimensional so uh, as we move uh, in this presentation we go into that a bit let's say deeper stuff that takes a bit more uh, of the uh, uh, waving hands <laughs> explaining things but the uh, one of the uh, one of the analysis was this uh, cost of degradation analysis and this is mm, uh, the numbers they look like 13 euros is 13 euros. It's it's a it's single dimensional thing, but there's there's a lot of things included there because when we when we start uh, asking and uh, uh, finding out what the what the cost of impairment of the marine environment is for our societies, like we saw in the video, we have to go uh, and use uh, indirect uh, methodologies uh, to get the numbers. So for the cost of degradation, we, we conducted uh, in, the, in the project, uh, we conducted uh, two different kinds of uh, analyses. First was the uh, benefits uh, foregone from not achieving the good ecological status of the, of the sea. And what it means that it, it includes both use and non-use values. So the non-use values like the aesthetic uh, value of the sea, you have to uh, use uh, questionnaires and, uh, and surveys to find those. But anyway, the, the value of reaching the good ec ecological status by 2040 was estimated to be a 5.6 billion euros per year. Uh, which can then be compared against the costs of uh, of protection. An important point in the Baltic Sea, really uh, characteristics uh, to the Baltic Sea protection, and also for the uh, an important feature uh, to the back sort of as a background for the policy making is the strong distribution of these benefits. They vary from country to country uh, because our well economic and social characteristics of of the, the countries vary. So the lowest Willingness to pay ranges were from uh, 13 euros uh, per year per individual to uh, 111. And the lowest was in Russia, the highest in Denmark. This is highly related to the income. If, if the incomes are small, then if you uh, evaluate this willingness to pay with the uh, monetary currency, then you get a lower value because the people have less to spend. And then there's also valuation issues. As Luke mentioned, uh, part of these uh, country-specific estimates uh, have been obtained using benefit transfer. So we, uh, there were no, uh, or there were five original studies, uh, and then these were expanded to uh, the other countries using these transfer methods. And this brings about a bit of uncertainty to this uh, uh, to these values, of course, because but but this this is a question of uh, efficiency of analysis and also uh, resources because it's always costly to do the original analysis. And then the other uh, other approach uh, is focusing on the recreational benefits foregone uh, due to degraded environment. And this is an alternative way to uh, uh, estimate the same value as, as, as is done above. So this should be not summed up. So this uh, analysis stated that the, the region misses 9 billion euros in recreational benefits. And, and it's always important to emphasize that these are not uh, like uh, a sum of cash inflows from various actors that are operating in the recreational business. This can be evaluated with different, uh, different methods. And they also in include stuff that do does not enter market transactions. Anyway, the individual foregone benefit estimates ranging again, the lowest Russia, 33, highest Denmark, 206 per year. And with this analysis, six of the nine, the country specific estimates were obtained using these benefit transfer methods. And again, here we have some uncertainty because uh, uh, how, how to transfer. So this, this is how the uh, results uh, look like. And this also illustrates the uh, the 
the method of of benefit transfer. The idea is uh, first, if you look at the left uh, left slide, you have uh, bars and you have uh, circles, and the bars are the original studies. So the idea is to find the, the closest uh, candidate for the uh, for the uh, country that is being estimated. For in, for instance, Denmark uh, was estimated using by transferring the results from Finland to Denmark. Why? That's because uh, economic and economic is the is the really the driving force of the gross domestic product uh, that uh, on these uh, value estimates and this can be uh, noticed from uh, from various sort of original valuation studies which include more countries with a lot of variations. So the so the lower the income, uh, the the lower the uh, the valuations. For the for the uh, environment expressed in monetary terms, it doesn't say that we as individuals in our souls how much we evaluate the environment. But when it comes to this common currency, which is money, then this can be expressed this way. Anyway, so Denmark is uh, transferred from Finland, and then Russia, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania transferred from Latvia. And with the uh, annual recreational benefits uh, for reaching uh, the the best environmental state from current state is then uh, transferred from Finland to Sweden and Denmark, and then again Russia, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania transferred from from Latvia. And this uh, brings about some errors, but uh, I I I think they hmm, well this is not a thinking thing uh, issue. We just have to bear in mind that that this is a trade off. So whether we always uh, conduct a full-scale analysis, uh, which is costly and takes more time, or whether we uh, analyze something, pick up analysis here and there, and then uh, use the transfer methods to get a bigger, uh, a broader picture. Auntie, uh, can I just jump in and ask a question here? On of this course. Slide? Yes, thank you. Um, I know that uh, there was a Baltic Stern report that was done, I think, maybe in 2010, which was sort of the starting inclinations of asking this, you know, the willingness to pay uh, to reach good environmental status or, you know, reach, uh, willingness to kind of adopt the Baltic Sea Action Plan by yes. the different countries. And I'd be curious to know if there's done any comparison with has that willingness changed? Has the sort of monetary value chain of, uh, changed? Obviously, there is a, a change in the value of money in itself. But whether now that we are, you know, still seeing that there are a lot of issues with the Baltic Sea and maybe new ones, if there has been any tendencies or trends that you can see on, you know, sort of the general public's willingness? Well, this is one of the uh, discussing with Janne Arte, a colleague of mine, who's, uh, who's been actually doing these valuation surveys. So. This was his message that that this uh, like systematic follow up of the development of the values of the Baltic Sea citizens, like not uh, uh, maybe maybe even conducting the Baltic Stern kind of survey, which would be less costly because that would be like repeating the same survey with different uh, sort of selection of individuals who reply, would bring us the uh, sort of the trend. We could follow up the overall trend in the in the willingness to pay uh, values. That said, I actually am not. Uh, I I think that uh, that uh, look. Would will you? Do you have a better uh, understanding uh, of the uh, of the of the development based on these values compared to the Baltic Stern? I believe the Baltic Stern uh, asked about uh, eutrophication and not, and these ones are on GES, so they're not comparable. Uh, so, and this gets then back to what Antti said, uh, and I think actually is one of our key messages towards the end. Um, the use of marine waters and the cost of degradation here are both very mature analyses uh, and future er, improvements uh, to come are not down to scientist uh, or development so much anymore. It will be about policy um, policymakers making investments or making decisions about about data um, uh, standardization and 
things on that end. Uh, so something like a every six year uh, valuation study where we don't have to make a new survey, we don't have to do it, you know, it's all just ready to go, uh, can be uh, cheaper. It can be then compared through time uh, and it may, uh, may be uh, valuable to the, to the region. Great. Thank you for that clarification, which I think is an important one um, that, you know, this will be used in a much uh, wider scope than the Baltic Stern, as well as, as you say, this could be a replicable uh, at a lower cost. Uh, we have just, so I, I guess since I opened the questions now, things are trickling in. Uh, we have just one question of clarification on methodology. Are the benefits results per capita of coastal population or per capita for each resident of that country? Uh, uh, each resident of the country, right? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Per the question is whether it's per... the, like whether there's a difference between coastal population. If you could define coastal population, and then and the benefits for the coastal population versus the benefits for the entire oh family. coastal population. Sorry, I missed that part. Uh, I think it's per capita of the whole. Yeah, and there are methods of uh, of this this question of uh, spatial uh, development of these values when you when you uh, increase the distance from the coastline. That's a, that's a totally different story. I would. Yet, like to go back to your question, uh, the, the the previous question uh, that we both already responded. Uh, but I think uh, the uncertainty that we have inher inherently in when we go about uh, asking people's valuations and uh, these non-market values, there's always uh, this bias. But the, the important thing is that the bias, uh, if we keep the questionnaire the same, the bias doesn't change. So the uh, repeating the surveys would bring uh, important in information on the development of these values, which would be much less biased or uncertain than these uh, sort of these uh, point estimates of, of, the, of the willingness to pay. And in terms of policy support, that would be really important. And uh, I, I, that, so that's really a crucial question there. Hmm. Uh, the, the one, I, I one thing we, I would say to yeah. the, young, the coastal thing is it we do have use rates for the countries with primary uh, valuations. So while those are for the entire population, you know, they are corrected, they are appropriately generated based on use rates. The transferred values, we took an average use rate, I think, or maybe use rate from the representative, the, the primary data country. And so that is a source of continued or increased uncertainty. Yeah, Great, so thank that's, you. that's taken into account is uh, that, that the use of, of marine waters is different between yeah. coastal areas, but that is per capita. Okay, um, we have one patient hand, uh, and I'm going to let that patient hand ask their question, but then we really need to move on with the presentation. And I'm assuming, Christine Pacalniete, that this is related to this, as you are from Active, which is also part of the original studies on GES. So please ask your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I have uh, been involved in, in many studies, uh, including also in this Baltic Stern. And I just wanted to, uh, yeah, to complement a bit the, the responses that we cannot really compare uh, the results with the Baltic Stern because Baltic Stern was focusing only on uh, on mm -hmm. uh, eutrophication. Now we have uh, this one study is about uh, go uh, good environmental status covering all environmental problems. And then, but what we can compare in principle is uh, because uh, also Baltic Stern results also included the benefits, uh, recreational benefits. And, uh, and, and we have uh, uh, these estimates as well, but, but the, the, the study for the, the Baltic Stern was conducted in 2010. And as we can observe in, in, uh, during these uh, last 10 years, there have been a lot of changes in recreational behavior and traveling behavior <laughs> uh, uh, due to uh, also various geopolitical uh, challenges and, and, mm -hmm. and problems. And, and that's why we also didn't uh, want to compare 
here also uh, these results uh, with the previous study. Also, the topic is the same, but 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 uh, the time difference is uh, larger uh, large. But I can say we conduct in Latvia such surveys regularly, and I can say uh, what we can observe from Latvia uh, that that the the values overall are increasing at least in such country as Latvia uh, for for when when we have um, uh, various uh, surveys on on similar topics. So there is increasing awareness and and willingness to pay for for marine environmental problems uh, of of citizens. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christine. Very interesting to get a, a national perspective on this. So sorry, Auntie and Luke, I, I give the floor back to you. No worries, Christina. Thanks for filling in. Good point. Uh, then uh, the then we go to uh, the tools that we. Uh, kind of two tools now that that. Uh, are being utilized to some extent and are being uh, sort of promoted to be utilized to some extent in the Baltic Sea topics. And one is uh, cost-benefit analysis. And, and with this one, we we uh, we shifted the uh, focus slightly to make it more general and more uh, policy support oriented instead of doing this. So here we go from the calculation of the numbers to the how can we utilize it. So we uh, we made it a bit uh, like a framework analysis. So the new aim uh, was to uh, provide like a, a guidebook for uh, cost, uh, conducting cost benefit analysis to assist policy making. And there's going to be a chapter in uh, in uh, Holas 3. Uh, and uh, and uh, let me just go through the, the the idea here. So we have we have uh, topics for which we can identify costs and benefits pretty clearly. So here in this graph, we have uh, we have one topic, which is which is actually in three different stages. But there's just one topic, which would you can you can think of this as uh, as usification or uh, let's say usification uh, a certain project. Cost benefit analysis is something that it's always interesting to say that, OK, the costs of Baltic Sea protection are lower than the benefits we obtain from it, but it doesn't help you with making any decisions. For individual decisions, we always need to have a project which have alternatives or just one alternative. We want to know whether this pays off. And the idea there is to compare the costs of the action or the actions against the benefits. And the, the two bars on the left, they indicate first that we the situation where we are now we were, we are thinking of uh, of uh, establishing a, a wastewater treatment facility somewhere Let, I mean, that's not a good example but but um, uh, wetland somewhere uh, and we based on the existing information that we have we have a, a high really high variation in the potential benefits that the uh, project is going to bring, bring about and Important to notice, these benefits are not the redu reduced number of nutrients only. It, it, it can be, uh, it should be the monetary value of that activity. And then you have the monetary value of the costs. But here too, you have ranges because you might have new technologies in new ways that you don't know. But the existing information gives you a lot of ranges to this on the vertical axis, the range of costs and benefits. So we are in a situation where with the, with the currently available uh, information that we have, we wouldn't be able to uh, conduct definite answers and definite recommendations from cost benefit analysis unless we invest in gathering new data. And the new data might narrow down the cost ranges and the benefit ranges like we see in the middle picture. And the further we invest, the investing means you pay for a researcher to conduct the analysis, gather data, do uh, surveys, uh, go about uh, reading uh, technology journals, uh, interviewing people who do actually the technology stuff, estimating the cost and benefits. And then finally, with this case, we are in a situation we have been able to narrow down the costs and benefits to the level that we actually know that this project pays off. But the question is, how long did it take to do the investment and whether there would be some underlying processes that would have been bad already while we do the cost benefit analysis? In this case, it could have been like a, like a month 
uh, and that's an easy, uh, that's a no-brainer. Then you should conduct the cost-benefit analysis. You use that to support your policy making. But in some cases, like in these really emerging uh, pollutants, like marine litter, micro marine litter, what's the damage it causes? What are the health effects to the ecosystem? What are the health effects to human beings? The benefit range is massive. And uh, we could say, if, if I would be like a, like a devil's advocate here, saying that I'm, a, I'm an industry representative, and I would say that I require that you uh, conduct a cost-benefit analysis on marine litter, and this is what you get because you don't know the benefit ranges. And, and you can't say that whether it really pays off to uh, make these massive investments on, on marine litter. And you could say that I require that we uh, analyze it uh, uh, more before we say whether it pays off or not. But the science in terms of uh, environmental health, in terms of human health, in terms of technology on uh, marine litter abatement, it takes years and maybe even decades to develop. And we might end up in a situation where we continue the bad thing uh, while waiting for the, the scientific data to improve. So we should be careful when uh, applying cost-benefit analysis. We should always do it, but we should uh, evaluate first that, that we have these principles, like precautionary principle. So the cost-benefit analysis uh, where we have a lot of uncertainty still going on uh, should not overrule the precautionary principle. This is one of the messages that we have. And what we have done is we've uh, basically listed uh, the topics of uh, of the uh, 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 of these uh, like fish, marine litter, nutrients, uh, and uh, and we've uh, kind of evaluated what the quality and status of the environmental information is. Environmental, socio-economic abatement cost information, and socio-economic abatement benefit information. These so marine litter, for instance, health benefits. We don't know too much about them. The abatement cost with marine litter, we really, really uh, have a poor understanding of what, if we would now start uh, being really active in marine litter abatement, what would be the winning technologies in 10 years' time? We don't know. So this is uh, how we have approached the cost-benefit analysis and hope to provide uh, like a, uh, a guidebook. How to, what is cost-benefit analysis? How, what's the legal background, of course, etc. But then, when is it really, really useful and when it's just supporting, when you can rely on it and when it's supporting the decision maker. This is a big difference. Okay. Uh, uh, then, then uh, so this is the final one where we have to explain a bit, sorry. Uh, but the, the other thing then that, that needs to, uh, where we need to look at the kind of the framework of decision making is the, the incentives and implementation of measures. It's, we all understand it's really important that the measures get implemented. But we, what we have already done so far is that we have been paying attention, which is the first step. It's the necessary first step that we pay attention to the effects of the measures that we do and on the costs of the measures what, that we do. And then the next step, uh, step when the economist uh, comes in and says that now we have to range, arrange these measures based on the cost-effective uh, there's ratios. And then we have to select the ones that give us the most good uh, in uh, bang for the buck, uh, are most uh, useful because we have limited resources. So take a look at the, the uh, picture on the, on the left. Uh, just imaginary activities like uh, agriculture, uh, uh, municipal wastewater treatment, or agriculture and industry, or forestry, okay, agriculture and forestry, and eutrophication, let's say, put it that way. And then within agriculture, we have measures, alternative measures that we can do. And these are uh, technical analysis, so costs and then the effects that we obtain. And based on the cost and effects, we, have, we make a combination because we can't have them all. We, 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 we don't have the money uh, or we don't have the time. We have to select so we get, with the available resources, we get the best results. So uh, this is the classic cost effectiveness analysis on, on the alternatives. So here with the, with the light green, I've emphasized that you use like, let's say 35% of the measure A you implement, you implement all of the measure A2, you implement 60% of the measure A3, uh, et cetera. We put the same for the activity three. And this would be the cheapest and easiest way to achieve a certain environmental effect when you combine these measures. So, uh, but the, then this is, this is a desktop exercise. Then you have to go and think that 
do I do I have anything that I can I can make these agents operating in activity A to conduct measure A2 or A3? And if I don't, uh, how does it change uh, situation with the other other measures? So the the availability of the incentives that we have, the instruments that we use, are able to use and able to tweak. That is crucial for the cost effectiveness. So here, just is the same imaginary example with just one minor change. So now we know that with the activity B, you really, with the current uh, societal system, economic regulatory system, you just can't interfere with the measure B, uh, B3. You don't have any tools to make that happen. And therefore, the entire set of uh, uh, cost-effective measures changes. You, ha you have to start implementing B1. And, and so and the point here is that uh, we should include just by identifying that, okay, when we plan, whatever kind of policies we plan, we say, but well, we do the measure A1. What is the instrument that we are going to use to make that happen? So this uh, incentives, uh, this, this will also be a report, uh, but uh, which also includes a list of like incentives instruments used in the Baltic Sea region. But for policymaking, this is the uh, most important message that, that uh, when planning, we should already know that whether we actually have something to make that reality. Because if we don't, then we're just fooling ourselves. Okay. So we actually uh, we have this uh, Helcom EG uh, ESA and we we we, uh, we discussed it in a, in a meeting presented this idea and then we collected uh, like systematically the the opinions of the uh, proponents and asked them whether whether uh, a stronger link between planned measures and implementation instruments in in the during the formulation of a program of measures or any other kind of policy planning would increase measures effectiveness and this. This is kind of obvious, but this also goes to show that it is really strong uh, from from environmental economics community, really a strong recommendation that even though things might look worse, if you look, take the reality constraints into account, then you are better off when you do it. So whether they are doable in practice, people think that they are quite doable, but they say they see constraints. But really, the recommendation and the simplest option is just to name the instruments for each measure. We can impose tax here. Okay, who's going to do that? And you can impose, uh, uh, name the, uh, the ministry that's, that's going to do it. And then you are also able to evaluate how realistic is that, how probable that they will actually uh, uh, implement the tax. Okay, and the, uh, uh, so this is just the, um, maybe uh, I could uh, pause for, for questions. I don't know how much, uh, yeah, we still have some time because this is like the content wise, this is, uh, this is the beef. Uh, or, or the, these were the, the beefs or vegetarian snacks, whatever. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, open uh, questions up the floor now. if there is anyone who has a question to just raise uh, their hand in. We have nothing in the chat. Nope. Okay, then let's move on. Okay. So this is basically uh, just the uh, status of the uh, of the uh, deliverables. Luke already mentioned the the coding process. It's the well, that's the most <laughs> most demanding uh, thing that that I can imagine in these these kinds of exercises is to actually uh, because normally and like in, in in our case we we are not the code writers and we there's there's a lot of communicating and and uh, uh, back and forth working with code with the sources and with the machinery. Uh, uh, I guess this is clear, but the key messages for science from this activity. Uh, so, uh, so the databases for uh, for costs and benefits that we 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 gathered and uh, Kind of uh, refilled, updated. Uh, they should be used and further developed because they, they are the um, they. Even though the the framework, how how we utilize the data uh, for science or for policy making, uh, 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 excuse me. Uh, 
the uh, these are the the uh, building blocks of any kind of scientific or political analysis, and these should be uh, really updated, uh, kind of continuously, but also utilized. The uh, sufficiency of measures, that's something that people are interested generally, Polities, policymakers are interested, because that's the key question, whether do, do we do enough? Uh, and and I've, uh, I have a background in uh, environmental economics, and basically all the research questions during the first, let's say, 10 years of my my career were always the same thing that whether whether this is uh, this cost effective is this cost effective and is it is it enough and it's uh, it's really complicated as we all know uh, but but we still are able when you when we conceptualize it from the uh, in a way that it would be flexible and it would be able to digest uh, information that gets more precise so it needs to be coherent uh and and there's there's a lot lot of effort that that should be put in developing the so, so uh sufficient of method measures method methodology uh and then uh, as discussed uh, previously the incentives should be incorporated in cost effectiveness analysis to avoid the situation where we give promises to policymakers that by do that, that actually you achieve this and this much. If if you do this, you should always uh, include the magical tools that you you make these desktop exercises become reality, which are the incentives that make people and companies actually undertake the measures or increase the abatement that they already do. And maybe for uh, policymakers. Uh, uh, this this can never be overemphasized that we we derive and we can uh, kind of connect a lot of value to the Baltic Sea and to the quality of the Baltic Sea environment, but this value can be greatly increased through environmental improvement. And 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 here's like the questions that you typically get that the why doesn't it, why doesn't it happen? One thing is that this value uh, doesn't come to a single person and it doesn't come to uh, people's uh, wallets or bank accounts immediately. It comes uh, in the form of welfare and that's value. So the majority of the value is in form of welfare, which is not trans, uh, there, there are no market transactions for good feeling. That's, uh, if there were, there would be a big market. Uh, uh, so, the, and, and this uh, increasing it, uh, requires coordination within the countries and between the countries. So the politi uh, uh, Baltic Sea Protection policies need to be maintained and intensified. And this maintain, I should have underlined it because that's uh, that's something that we should never forget that we've achieved improvements in uh, certain areas of the Baltic Sea, at least pressures. So the, uh, so the nutrient loading to the Baltic Sea has decreased dram dramatically. But this is not something that we can kind of fix in our minds. That it, that's the level we've achieved, and we don't go back. We have to uh, keep investing and keep being prudent in uh, in uh, uh, environmental permitting, re-investing in, uh, in the infrastructure that's taking care of the abatement. We need to work to remain the same. And we need to re work more to improve. So uh, keeping the current level uh, requires work. Improving requires more work. Uh, the um, use of marine waters and the cost of decoration uh, uh, depends on data standardization and data development policies. Well, and and uh, this uh, data sharing, data centralization for cost of effectiveness of environmental measures should be a high priority nationally and regionally, and this should be done even though we are not, uh, let's say. Uh, always 100% sure that that, that the uh, uh, that that the results are like uh, there, there's uncertainty. There's always uncertainty. That should not uh, uh, prevent us from sharing that that information. And here uh, maybe that the, the four could be also be formulated into that we discussed earlier that we should maybe have follow up 
uh, to this development of environmental valuation, a systematic follow-up and systematic following of, of environmental valuation results. So these uh, results, of course, they've, they've been uh, and they will be used in, uh, in, in many, many occasions. Uh, uh, the data uh, was obtained from uh, these sources. Uh, well, particularly, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't want to emphasize any, and I, I don't need to read. Uh, for this one, yes, I would just say do. that uh, the, the economic and social analyses is such a cross-cutting topic that our data comes from everywhere. Uh, yes. I could have filled three or four slides probably with this. We got um, you know all these major data aggregators like Eurostat and Edmonet. Um, and the couple different national statistics bureaus, and of course, all the ones that can national statistics bureaus that contribute to Eurostat projects, Helcom bodies, uh, the strength and uh, somewhat the weakness of of this uh, topic is that uh, we try to consider so many different. You know, we're, we're very uh transdisciplinary but it also exposes us to or the top the topic to a lot of uh usually high data needs and things because we need uh so much information and so uh there are blues activities there are uh just just about any any place anybody got data we got data from that too <laughs> Great. Thank you. Is so this that, the last slide? Uh, uh, this is a list of uh, outputs, but we, this is pretty much uh, 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 this is pretty much it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Antti and Luke. Not an easy topic to sort of present in such a condensed way, which I think you've done quite successfully. Um, there's no additional questions I've seen in the chat, so I guess it was so clear, crystal clear. Um, but I, I have one question that I'm kind of curious about. Um, I mean, I'm thinking what you've said is, as you say yourself in your own words, that this cost benefit analysis is very much uh, theory, <laughs> desktop, but to get it to practice is sort of the challenge in a sense. And when you show that there would be different measures that you could mix together to get the best impact, that is quite a, a challenge, isn't it, to then follow up how the nine countries around the region have actually put those measures in place, or they might do it differently. And we also know that there are different, um, you know, four years of political parties then change, then they might change yeah. the regulation, et cetera. So in a sense, it, it's very good in a theory, but very challenging in sort of the practical sense. So do you have any sort of... Um, I don't know, summary. I mean, you touched upon it in the yeah. policy end bit, but is there any sort of, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kind of term it the same way as I did before, your kind of plea on this, because it's obviously a, a stronger um, measure that a lot of decision makers are looking to about the cost benefit. And this will be even more so now in the current situation we have with inflation in many of the countries. So what would you say, uh, if, if you had a decision maker in front of you, what would be your sort of pitch key message? Well, baby steps. The baby <laughs> step would be that let's not try to uh, start, or if we start, then the framework development is quite difficult to start doing it in the Baltic Sea, like regional level immediately. But for each and every country, when we do the, like, we plan the measures. So just accepting the uh, uh, the uh, fact that for, for, for you to be able to implement anything, you need incentives and you need instruments. So that's that's one thing, one of the, uh, things I would say that be sure that you name the instrument that and incentive you are, you are going to uh, use when implementing this and that measure. If you don't have it, then you for now, for the time being, just uh, forget that from your instrument and set, from your measure set. Do something else that you can do. And for the cost benefit analysis, then I would uh, I would say that don't let that uh, overrule the precautionary principle. I think that's maybe the most important thing. Continue supporting science, 
that's promo- uh, providing you with better information. And this is the stuff that we've been listening for the morning, for the morning presentations. Those are the, the individual things that narrow down the ranges of our estimates. Continue doing that. But if you think it's complicated, don't let the uh, analysis fool you uh, and, and to sort of bypass the precautionary principle things. If you are dealing with things you don't know, that's maybe the Key Thank you very much, Antti. So we have now completed this session on activity one, uh, and we, we have a coffee break now, um, which is a little bit shorter because I, I thought this in, was so interesting to kind of discuss around it and, and, and get this broader package because we will talk about the next steps of the projects uh, in the coming session. Welcome back. Hopefully you have taken some caffeine uh, ready and charge for the last session of the conference and that you've all filled in the Slido, um, which we see here is the Baltic Sea is competing with the Blue Sea. So I think everyone is very Blues project biased, obviously, uh, from the results here. Um, and tears, seas of tears or of joy seem to have come afterwards as well as the Red Sea. And I'd be curious to know if someone was brave enough to let us know and share how you were thinking when you chose Sea of Tears of Joy. Anyone who want to jump in? We had 21 people doing the poll, so we're maybe getting less excited responses at the end of the day. I'm having tears of joy for sure. Okay, good. And do you want to share why, Johanna? Uh, Because I'm so happy that our cooperation team uh, organizing this conference has been working so successfully. Great. Yes, that's a good occasion for having seas of tears. Okay. So, like I said, this is the last uh, session of the conference. Um, And as I mentioned before, there are three videos that have been produced within the Blues project. And now we get the opportunity to see the last of the three, which will premiere again uh, during this conference, which is really looking at how to apply the the Blues project to the HOLAS 3 assessment. So I'm going to give the floor to Jana Wolf again to present the video um, on on this last video session that we have. Jana. Thank you, Rutilia. So as you said, this is our third video and it features the holistic assessment of the Baltic Sea, so HOLAS. And as we heard today, this has been a very essential part of the Helcom Blues project. And uh, similar as with the other videos, it will be made available on the meeting portal and project site. And this video is intended to be used also far after the project has ended already. And I think it will set the mood quite nicely for Janika Hadin's later talk on blues and the bigger picture it fits into. So please allow me to share my screen to show the video once more. Yes, here it is. So it's a little bit less than two minutes and uh, here we go. To better understand the Baltic Sea environment and our relationship with it, HELCOM provides holistic assessments of the state of the Baltic Sea, or HOLAS for short. Each holistic assessment captures a comprehensive snapshot at a given moment in the dynamic life history of the Baltic Sea. The assessment is holistic because it aims to provide insight into what drives change in the marine ecosystem. It analyzes how and what activities put pressures on the ecosystem, how these pressures affect the state of the environment and cause impacts on biodiversity, the ecosystem and how it functions. Based on this information, we then need to establish effective measures to minimize these negative impacts. The ultimate goal being to ensure a good status for the marine environment. Nationally collected, regionally reported and harmonized data form the foundation of HOLAS. HELCOM has identified specific elements for biodiversity, eutrophication and pollution, which function as indicators to track changes in the state of the environment. These indicators constitute the building blocks for the assessment. 
The results are then progressively aggregated, ultimately culminating in the overall summary report on the state of the Baltic Sea. This allows the users to access the information at the level that best suits their needs. HOLAS provides an increasingly clearer picture of what the state of the Baltic Sea is and why and how things are connected. It also allows tracking progress and effects of already existing measures and helps the HELCOM countries around the Baltic to come together and agree on the next steps to curb negative impacts and improve the status of the Baltic Sea. Okay, I will stop sharing now. So that was our final video of the day. I hope you liked it. And I will give the floor back to Otilia. Thank you, Jana. So uh, we've come to sort of the end part of our conference. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up on the big picture, as Jana said. And I'd like to introduce Yannicka Haldin, which I think is no stranger to this community. Uh, is the Deputy Executive Secretary of Helcom and Manager of this Blues Project. And she works really on focusing on the wide range of issues and is closely engaged with the implementation of different frameworks, both on the global level, EU level and regional level of international uh, frameworks and with other organizations and conventions like the Convention on Biodiversity, on ICs, IUCN, OSPAR, UNESCO, UNEP, the list is long. Um, and a very busy lady, I think, uh, who has sort of been a success in, in wrapping this project together with all the staff involved. And she will now present sort of the next steps of what will happen when now that we have all these results collected together uh, from the project. And also a chance for you who is listening in to ask broader questions to both Yannicka as well as the coordination project coordinator. Uh, so please again, write your questions in the chat. Uh, and with that, I give the floor to Yannicka. Please welcome. Thank you. Just checking that you can still hear me. The sound check was a long time ago. Yes, yes. very good. Very good. Okay, I shall share my screen. So there, hopefully now you can see on full screen. Yes, I see some nodding. Okay, yes, hello everyone. Uh, so uh, I will have the final presentation uh, at this event uh, and I will focus on the bigger picture of the Blues project, both uh, placing Blues uh, in a bigger framework, but also looking beyond uh, Blues and, and what happens um, or has already happened with the deliverables that that has come out of the project. Uh, so first of all, we've heard a lot about the activities and the deliverables that have been produced and, and the work that has been going on. Uh, but it's oh sorry, <laughs> but it's important to remember that that uh, of course while these are are core parts of the project. The project has an overall objective, um, something that we've, which each uh, individual activity and strand have stri strived to reach. Uh, and that is, is what you can see on your screen right now. So uh, this is support regional capacity, coordination and cooperation with regards to developing effective measures and secure good status of the marine environment. And then this has been specified to say that this includes provisioning and making available the necessary knowledge to advance the development and implementation of these measures uh, and to provide concrete support for decision-making processes within the Baltic Sea region. So throughout this presentation, I will uh, come back to this a little bit uh, and, and touch on different parts of this overall objective to look at how well have the project actually managed to achieve this. But first, uh, I would like to come back to what you just saw in the video a little bit. So what's the logic behind the Blues work? When we look at the bigger picture, we have to understand that each part, each component and activity within the Blues work, Blues work fit into a bigger framework. And that's what you see on the screen here. So this is a management framework that uh, Helcom uses, but also many other organizations and initiatives around uh, the globe. Um, and it looks at the interlinkages between the activities that, that we 
do that have an effect on the marine environment. That effect is usually in the form of some form of pressure. Uh, the pressure then affects uh, the state of the environment. So you have a certain, like the video said, a snapshot and you add pressure and the state changes. This change is an impact. So it has a pressure has an impact on, on the environment. And then when these impacts become too big, we need to take measures to curb the, the negative effects, uh, as was presented, for example, in the activity one presentation earlier today. Now, how do you use these management frameworks? So you can use these for um, whatever topic you're working with. For example, here we have the biodiversity. So then for each of the components under biodiversity, we look at uh, all of these different steps and we try to identify and understand them to the best of our ability so that we can be as effective as possible in our measures. But it also works for any of the other topics that we've talked about here today. Now, Blues as a project uh, has been targeting many of these, but for each, uh, each of the steps only for one or maybe two of the topics. So Blues looks at activities, it looks at pressures, state impact and measures, but to different degree under the different um, activities. And this is important to remember because uh, a project that could address everything in one project for each topic, that would be quite impressive and I think quite hard to pull off. So uh, projects such as Blues are used to target uh, areas where we realize that we have gaps. If for a topic, we, for example, need to know more about the pressures or we need to know more about the impact or measures, then that's where we target the, the work within the project. And that's uh, how Blues has been working. Now, we were uh, in the objective, you could see that we were talking about good environmental status. Now, uh, this is, of course, um, a state that many different uh, initiatives want to uh, reach. So we have many instruments and the same goal. Uh, and for a project such as Blues, there's then the opportunity to kind of feed the work that Blues is doing into many different processes uh, and thus ensure that, that the work is used to the largest extent possible. So under Helcom, we have the convention itself, which of course strives to reach good environmental status. We have the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which I will come back to later. And we have a number of recommendations that kind of uh, provide more specific measures. Uh, under the EU, we have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, where we have also heard today that a lot of the Blues work um, feeds into uh, the MSFD and the MSFD processes and are linked to these processes where they're currently ongoing at the EU level, such as for noise. Uh, we also have the Water Framework Directive. We have the Habitats and Birds Directive that target good status for, um, for uh, biodiversity. And we have the EU Biodiversity Strategy, which is the, the newest in a number of initiatives. Uh, and Blues then ties into all of these. Uh, and I will show you a little bit how that is done by talking about how Blues has supported regional cooperation and coordination. Um, and here you can see that this then targets the first part of the objective. So here we're looking at how well have the, has the project managed to achieve this. So out of these different initiatives, uh, Blues has as a primary target, the Baltic Sea Action Plan and the MSFD. And uh, these are both very tightly bound to this Hollas project that the video was talking to, uh, talking about, sorry. Uh, uh, and as you can see, we have Blues here in the middle and Blues has functioned as a platform, um, like very concretely, where uh, the countries, uh, the experts uh, and the Helcom community in general has had a chance to try to align the needs under these different initiatives and then uh, progress this under the same project uh, with the ultimate goal then of reaching good environmental status. But then why do you need this type of cooperation in the first place? And, and how has Blues actually uh, functioned when it comes to cooperation? So one of the first and maybe most important thing is that we can't all be experts on everything, but in order to improve the status, 
we do need to tackle almost everything that we're doing in the marine environment. So uh, we need some way of benefiting on, uh, from the expertise of others. And around the Baltic Sea, different institutions and different countries uh, have different strengths. They have focused on different parts um, of this management framework or on different topics. And projects such as Blues, uh, which is really broad, as we could see in the presentations today, really is a possibility for countries and institutions in other parts to learn from those that have more experience or have maybe done things in a different way. There's also the need to share knowledge and information, uh, as we could hear from activity one. They rely heavily on information that comes from a broad range of topics, and this type of information is then collected under the project, specifically under, uh, under the activity that deals with, with data, um, and, and then shared so that not only in the project, but also beyond, uh, this data can be used for different purposes. It's also easier to develop something one time than to develop something 10 times. No, we don't all need to invent the wheel uh, again and again. So if we share resources uh, through a project such as Blues, um, then it lowers the overall resource demand for the, doing these types of developments. Uh, and this has been very clearly done in, in Blues where uh, the information has then been dis disseminated uh, across the Baltic Sea region. Then there's also the possibility to improve uh, the actions that we are taking or, or the development that we're doing uh, because we can make sure that there is stronger regional coherence and coherence uh, can then um, support synergistic action. So if we develop uh, a measure somewhere, we might rely on the knowledge or information that comes from another um, activity. And then it's really important to cooperate at the regional level because we need to, to do this work at a scale that is ecologically relevant. Uh, so essentially the scale at which the environment functions and the environment doesn't recognize our national borders. So we need to make sure that that when we do develop, develop methods and measures, that these are appropriate um, for the purpose that they are going to be used for. And that purpose is most often uh, beyond the national jurisdictions uh, of individual countries. Then uh, Blues has had the uh, opportunity to kind of support cooperation uh, by di directly linking with the HELCOM community. So the HELCOM um, groups have been able to provide steer and guidance to the work that has taken place within the project and also approve many of the, of the deliverables, which means that they can put, be put into direct use uh, both at HELCOM, in HELCOM, but also on a national level where, where they choose to do so. Uh, and this uh, mobilizes the work within the project very quickly, making it available uh, with very little delay. Here's an example of all of the working groups and the expert groups that have been involved uh, in the work. So you can see that this has covered a large part of the, the HELCOM scientific community and also uh, reached the policy and management levels uh, directly through, through this approval and review processes in the working groups. And all of this has helped uh, coordinate and, and kind of uh, increase the cooperation uh, between the countries in the Baltic Sea region with respect to the topics in Blues. Now we're going on to the next step of the, of the objective, uh, which is increasing capacity. So as we could see, the idea has been to support regional capacity. Uh, for example, by provisioning and making available necessary knowledge. Now, this ties very closely into what we've been discussing in this uh, event today. Um, but in addition to the actual deliverables, we, we, we will get to very soon. There's also other ways that the project has increased capacity uh, within the region. Uh, first of all, of course, there is this that we already touched on that the experts have a chan chance to cooperate using Blues as a platform and learn from each other. 
Uh, it's also allowed experts who are new uh, to regional work uh, and haven't worked within, say, under the umbrella of Helcom before, um, to get insight into how regional work functions and, and establish corporations that uh, will last also beyond the duration of the project, including the, their engagement with the regional level development. Uh, it also provides leverage uh, or has provided leverage uh, for establishing novel and long-term regional cooperative platforms. So increasing the capacity at the regional level to take on these topics in the future. Uh, this is, for example, through the revitalization of the expert group on zooplankton, uh, the new uh, expert group on food web, which uh, is still temporary, but is now up for discussion that maybe this could be uh, made a permanent feature uh, and strengthening work on indicators under the expert group on phytoplankton, uh, where their focus has, has primarily lied elsewhere before. Uh, it has severely uh, improved the data flows and data availabil availability, which is really important for capacity because it allows us not just to use the data for um, one purpose, but it's this uh, once you establish data flows, then you can use that data for whatever purpose you have need for. Uh, and then support accessibility to the assessment processes and the assessment products uh, and so on through developing these short key message videos that we could see today, which explain how these processes actually function and what the purpose is. Uh, and things like the updated indicator website, where it's possible for anyone to go and look at um, the results for now the now very broad over 50 uh, indicators that that we have available uh, for the Baltic Sea region. So we will look now at uh, more closely at the the provisioning and making available knowledge for Holas 3. Uh, so Holas is done every six years. It's a repeat assessment and it results in the state of the Baltic Sea report. And we are currently in the middle of the assessment, uh, the third iteration of the assessment uh, runs 2022 to 2023, uh, and it covers the assessment period 2016 to 2021, which is, of course, then what has also been the work in Blues. And here, uh, it's a, a kind of quick overview of a lot of the deliverables that were presented earlier today. Um, you can see that they aren't only kind of presented in this final conference, but many of them have already been presented for approval and inclusion in this third holistic assessment. So they've gone within the project timeframe, they've gone from conceptual idea to actual deliverable, uh, not just for the project, but on a regional level in a, in a regional assessment. Uh, and as you can see, this is true for, for all of the topics that have been included. It also means that these deliverables have a long lifespan because once they are approved, um, they become part of, of the HELCOM um, stable of indicators or assessment methodologies, which is uh, what we base the next uh, assessment on, um, so HOLAS 4. Then we look at MSFD quickly. So how has BLUES provided support for national reporting under the MSFD? So this is also for capacity building. Um, so the work within Blues has been aligned and provides concrete support to uh, the national MSFD reporting in the HELCOM contracting parties who are also EU member states. This has been done by adjusting all the timelines within the work and the project uh, to fit uh, the MSFD processes and to make sure that all the indicator evaluation results and the assessments uh, are available uh, for the EU member, the Baltic Sea EU member states, as part of their national reporting, and here, for example, the indicator web, website is a key component of this because this is uh, the way that um, contracting parties can access this information, and also ensures that the information is available for a very long time, which is needed for national reporting. Um, so where uh, where 
it's not possible for contracting parties who are EU member states to use direct results. So, for example, they do not incorporate the direct results of an indicator into their national reporting. It doesn't mean that this work within Blues would be lost. Because there is also uh, a possibility to, of course, use the methodology and the tools that have been developed within the project to run national uh, evaluations or assessments for the same topic where, for example, other data can be included. So there's like many layers within these, um, within the BLUES uh, results that in, help to enhance capacity within the region. Then we're going to look quickly at the Baltic Sea Action Plan and how uh, BLUES has worked to enhance the capacity for implementing the action plan. So as you could also see in uh, some of the uh, presentations, there are direct links between the BLUES work and many of the actions in the action plan. These can be either almost full implementation, uh, as it's the, the point, for example, when uh, for um, coastal fish and the development of coastal fish indicators, um, or it can be a vital step that is needed in order to eventually reach full implementation, a step without which we essentially would not be able to to, at some point, put a tick mark between the action, or beside the action flow, sorry. Uh, and as you can see, this covers a broad range of actions uh, across all of the topics that have been included in the, in the project. Now, we have a lot of very nice deliverables, and now we have seen how we can use these to uh, increase capacity and cooperation and so on. But the end point, uh, of course, is that it needs to somehow move from the scientific level into the decision-making level in order for them to feed back uh, into actual change in the environment. Uh, and uh, that is also one of the core aspects or one of the objectives of the BLUES project is to make sure that, that this uh, information, the knowledge that has been um, developed and produced within the project can actually be used for decision-making processes. Uh, and as you can see, that's the last bit of the objective here on the slide. So how is this then concretely done? Yeah, so the project provides decision makers and authorities with the information on status of the environment, for example, pelagic habitats, food webs, harbor porpoise and non-commercial fish. But under several of these, there are many steps. So it's not the topic uh, as a whole only, but also we know, for example, for harbor purpose, it's distribution and abundance, or uh, for pelagic habitats, it's um, zooplankton and phytoplankton and so on. So you can get down to very specific information if needed. It also provides information on the distribution of pressures. We have underwater noise and marine litter in the project. And it provides really important information on human activities uh, and their effects. Uh, as well as on society and economical, uh, economic aspects. Now, while we know that this information is available, um, we need to make sure that that's now transferred to the decision-making level uh, within the different countries around the Baltic Sea. And this has been strengthened by making sure that, that uh, the management bodies and the authorities around the countries have had a very like concrete and continuous update of what is going on in the project so that they have a chance to incorporate this uh, in decision making processes which are often uh, like quite long running and and you need to plan quite a lot in a, uh, ahead if you want to incorporate something uh, and this has been done by presenting the steps of the process in all of the Helcom working group meetings, like you could see on the slide earlier here. Uh, and then also make it clear, how, like what are the needs of decision makers when it comes to the results that we're presenting? And as you could see, we have a, a short um, kind of policy key message uh, for each of the different topics uh, to that is easily communicate communica communicatable, <laughs> communicable, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we can use also beyond the project because it guides work that happens in the future. 
And now this uh, information that we have available uh, moves on and uh, it will guide future decision making um, to inform them on where do we have areas in poor status, what is causing this poor status, where, and this in turn should in, uh, influence where we target our measures, what measures we choose, and this is very close to what is done under activity one, uh, and what activities do we need to manage so that we make sure that we target uh, our resources where they do the most good. And this is where a project like Blues really can help. And as conclusions, uh, we, can co we can conclude that projects such as Blues uh, enables us to incorporate new findings uh, and continuously improve how we perform assessments uh, at the regional level, but also on a national level for those that want to pick up the, the results. Uh, making these assessments increasingly more relevant and more actionable, because this is a key word when it comes to how do you include them in, in decision-making processes. It's like, it's good that you provide information, but you need to provide it in a form that means that you can take action based on that information. Uh, otherwise, it's interesting, but it's not actionable. Uh, Products such as Blues allow countries to capitalize on the strengths of others and jointly develop methodology and directly usable end products so that the project uh, doesn't only become a stepping stone uh, in a continual process of development, but that when the project ends, you actually have something concrete that you can use and implement and that provides uh, added value. And uh, Blues has significantly progressed our understanding of the marine environment uh, and our relationship with it. And this is fed then directly into the State of the Baltic Sea report, which we can share with a broader audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janneke, for giving us this very condensed presentation and quite impressive, I have to say, on, on seeing how many deliverables you managed to get through this uh, project. Um, I, I really commend all the parts that have been done and, and really nicely putting that together, how that feeds in both on a national level, regional level, truly a regional project, as well as helping on EU processes further than the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, so I think, you know, this presentation, you gave us a really good insight in what the project has had for deliverables and how the project has achieved its objectives. And, you know, we've, we've come back to this quite a few times that the ultimate aim is really to achieve effective measures to secure a good status or a good environmental status. And, um, you know, looking at the European processes and the, and the Baltic Sea Action Plan process, these are sometimes have been at different timelines. This is used very frequently and may to some be felt a bit like a buzzword that it's a sort of achievement to get to, but quite hard to actually realize. So what would you say um, is important with this good status of environment and why are measures key for this? Uh, okay, thanks. Yes, uh, <laughs> I think uh, good status of the environment, although it is used as a buzzword, uh, underlying it uh, or underpinning it is this core concept that that society is part of this environment. Uh, when we talk about good status of environment, we have to remember that it's not something that is external to um, our own existence or well-being. Uh, but something that, that we are a part of. So without good status of the environment, uh, we also can't achieve like the full potential that we could uh, as a society. Besides that, of course, um, good status of the environment also secures um, like resilience and, and buffering capacity and so on. Uh, for species all across the Baltic Sea, species uh, whose role for the overall well-being of the ecosystem we might be fully unaware of at the moment, but but whose importance is nonetheless great. Uh, so good environmental status is used <laughs> often as a buzzword because it's part of, of um, like the policy 
lingo uh, that we use, but underpinning it is this very real and very um, concrete aspect of the whole ecosystem of which we are part. And measures are a really important part of this uh, because essentially for the Baltic Sea, everything that is wrong with the Baltic Sea, the key uh, or the core component of that is us. Like whatever issue you can pick up, you can always trace it back to humans and us as a society. Uh, and they, that's where measures come in. We can't, the, the ecosystem is incredibly complex. Uh, it's not possible to manage the environment, but it is possible to manage our own activities so we cause as little harm as possible. We are part of the environment, so it's not that we should, like that our activities should have, should have no effect whatsoever. Um, that's not possible, I think, to achieve. As long as we are here, we, we will leave a footprint. But it's to understand how our activities influence the environment and minimize the negative aspect of that. And that's where measures come in. These measures, they need to target our activities because that's where we have, like, as the, I think Antti said, most bang for the buck. <laughs> like we get the most benefit out of it uh, because we understand the chain of events that have led to that activity and then what uh, negative effects that activity causes. Uh, and I think that's where measures are key. And Great. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for that answer. And I mean, now that we're coming to the end of this project and it's been going on for two years, I'd be curious to know what kind of learnings have you taken from this uh, venture in the Project Blues? I mean, you, you, there's, there's so many elements to it. So it would be interesting to hear a little bit if you had any sort of um, things that you're most excited about that have come out of this project, sort of learnings and what challenges. I think one of the one of the kind of key take home messages for myself is the importance of having a good plan when you start which you know isn't necessarily so much uh, a deliverable but it, it's something that uh, I think has been very helpful and here I want to uh, especially like lift uh, Jana the project coordinator who has really pulled it all together. Uh, it's a very complex project in the sense that it contains so many different parts, uh, all of which belong to the same overall framework, but are very, have all have their individual challenges uh, to face and, and so on. And I think uh, this has, she has been doing this excellently. Uh, and also uh, the importance of having the right experts and the right people in the right place. Uh, and uh, to have this continuous communication with the end users, because here uh, we can work really hard for two years and come up with very good products. But if those products don't meet the needs of the end users, then their value is significantly decreased. So this continuous discussion um, with managers and policymakers and the other experts in the expert groups really kind of helps massage the products into something that is usable uh, by the end and user-friendly. And I think you can see that in uh, how many of them, as you say, we've managed to really get through and approved uh, and directly used in, in Hollas 3. Um, so this constant dynamic, I think, uh, has been a, an important part to, to keep in mind. And this also goes uh, not just with the experts and, and the policymakers in this region. But there's also uh, the project has allowed us uh, to work quite closely with other regions, for example, with OSPAR um, and the Nia Panacea project. Um, and uh, as many of you are aware, uh, Helcom and OSPAR have uh, contracting parties that are shared between the two uh, regional sea conventions. So it's been also very useful for <laughs> those contracting parties uh, to make sure that the work is aligned as far as possible uh, between the two uh, regional sea conventions. 
And this is something that without the project is much harder to achieve um, because you might be working on different things at different times and and to try to kind of streamline these processes is not as um, straightforward as maybe we would all hope. Great, and, and you're alluding a little bit to my, my next question, which is, I mean, obviously it's fantastic to have done this cooperation with OSPAR where you have interlinkages in the sea, but also this is, um, you know, an exercise that a lot of the European seas need to do for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, as well as other directives, both nationally and European. And so I was wondering, do you, what advice would you have, and maybe also for those that are in the European Union listening in, since this is a co-funded project on the advice of probably applying this, if it's not already done, in other regional seas, what kind of advice would you give uh, of, of sort of setting up this type of project? Uh, I think it's very important to document not just the end results, but how you got there, because that really helps other uh, regions to, to kind of pick up, because even though we are all part uh, of the European Union, the regions all have different challenges and, and uh, different kind of strengths that, that they can capitalize on. Uh, so it might not be a one-to-one -one, um, transfer where you can just move something from the Baltic to the Med or, or to the North Atlantic and so on and vice versa. Uh, so you need to document each step and, and like outline methodology and so on so that other regions have a chance to, to kind of take the bones and then maybe build something else out of it, something that serves their purposes uh, better. Uh, and I think this is a, a really important um, part of the, the way that you work within a project like this. It also helps um, with transparency in general and, and adopting the results and, and so on. Uh, then. I think something, if you're talking about uh, any potential um, commission uh, people in the audience, <laughs> I think in general I, that uh, funding for these types of projects where you have quite a lot of freedom to, to target the, the gaps and the kind of weak points that you have experienced in each region are really important. Uh, and and that, they, that you have the... Yeah, that, that we all, all, each region gets the opportunity to try to fill the gaps using what has been done in another region. This is true, for example, for this project with food webs, because we have not in the Baltic Sea worked with food webs uh, to any great extent under Helcom before, and uh, OSPAR has. So when we started this work, the natural like the natural place to go and look for this information uh, on how have you gone about it was OSPAR. Uh, and, uh, and because there happened to be a project under OSPAR and a project under Helcom, there was also a natural uh, kind of link between the two regional sea conventions that could be used to then allow this information to flow between the different areas. So I think uh, overall these these types of projects are very important that aren't that are targeted but targeted for each region individually. Great, excellent to hear that part. Um, I want to open the floor if anyone uh, who is listening in has any questions to Yannicka or anyone else in the Blues project. Uh, please raise your hand or just uh, Open up your mic. This is an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions. Yes, we have from Maud uh, Casier from the European Union. Thank you very much um, for these presentations and for this excellent conference. Uh, I just wanted to express briefly um, our appreciation at EU level um, for, so for this project. And I think uh, it's uh, very important for us to hear the messages which uh, have been spread all along the conference, um, of course, for the science, but uh, more, more importantly for the policymakers. And I, I must say, I really appreciated the way this conference was made. And I think um, these messages were very clear and the fact that all those presentations were done 
in a similar um, schema with it, with this um, this message was really good. Uh, I, I think it makes things very clear, and uh, you can count on me to report uh, to my commission's colleagues on these very good outcomes, uh, but also on what we should uh, consider for any possible future projects. Uh, I think this is a so good lesson learned for us. Um, and just a final word to really reiterate uh, our appreciation, but also to reiterate the fact that um, this work is extremely important for the implementation of the marine strategy framework directive and uh, HALCOM and more generally uh, regional work of all uh, regional CIS convention is, is really key in that sense, as you know, and this is embedded in the whole uh, directive. Uh, so I can only um, so support uh, what uh, Yannicka just said uh, as regards uh, the need to make the links between the different uh, regional works. Thank you very much. Anyone else raise hand or question? Now is your opportunity. No? Okay. Oh, Yannicka, please. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if there are no further questions, I would like to take this opportunity yeah. to, to uh, express my thanks and uh, gratitude to uh, all of the partners in the project who made this possible and, uh, and also, of course, especially to the Secretariat team who have been working very hard uh, to make all of this happen over the last two years uh, and to kind of press upon all of you to know that uh, your work has been very valuable and without it, we would not be uh, able to have a status of the Baltic Sea report that is nearly as uh, comprehensive and as good as the one that we are currently making. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Janika, reminding everyone's hard work. And we have uh, a raised hand from Elena Kurokova. Please. Yes. I, I, I just want to do the same. It was very intellectually rewarding to work with Helicom Secretary and people who were dry, r r leading us in this uh, work, uh, like research experts or scientific experts in different fields, which I assume it's extremely difficult and challenging, and you have to know at least a little bit about something that they're doing to be able to do that. It was it, it was excellent experience. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Elena. Uh, I see some thumbs up. Okay, well, um, oh, I have Jana. <laughs> Go ahead, Jana. <laughs> yes, thank you. I just would like to tune into basically what has been the general uh, vibe and feedback for this conference and this project in general, that it was an absolute pleasure working in this project and with everyone involved in this, like both from all the uh, different partners, subcontractors, and people at the secretariat themselves, and of course also uh, Big thank you to Yannika for being the project manager and pulling everything together as well. And to you also, Otilia, for being a fantastic moderator for today. Thank you very much. And um, I'm not quite done with Yannika in terms of questions. I thought we would wrap up with one last thing. So it's nice to also get a little bit of feedback from everyone that I, I really get the sense, me coming in as an observer into this, that it's been a very successful project, um, a lot of, you know, trust and uh, building of a team and capacity within the region, which is really important. So, you know, that's excellent. But I think as many might be thinking, at least what I'm thinking is what comes next. So Yannicka, can you share with us maybe what are the next steps now after this conference, now that the Baltic Blues Conference is sort of wrapped up and the project is wrapped up? Yeah, so... Uh... For most of the the kind of outputs of the project, like the concrete outputs, like indicators and so on, uh, the next steps are now uh, to be included in the State of the Baltic Sea uh, report. Uh, but following that uh, is then a, a wide review of the methodology and the indicators, all of the indicators, all of the methodology that was included uh, in the Hollis Tree process. Um, and then look at, okay, we did good, but how could we do better? 
so where do we have gaps? Where are there still weaknesses or, or where could it be further developed? Um, and this type of review process will be done uh, at the end of 2023, early 2024. Uh, based on this, we will make work plans for all of the indicator work, including the indicators that are in, uh, and, and the methodology and analyses that have been done under the Blues project, uh, and make these uh, individual work plans for each of the topics and each of the themes towards the next assessment. <laughs> so there is no rest for the wicked. <laughs> when the one assessment is over, we have to start on the next one in order to make sure that we again have the chance to improve uh, on what we have been working on uh, and fill any gaps. Because every time that, that we do uh, this kind of exercise and we progress, uh, other gaps or new gaps might emerge that we weren't aware of before and that we then need to to take into account. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's kind of the next steps um, for much of the information that uh, comes from the, from the Blues project. One last uh, question that's trickled into the chat is when is the publication of Holas 3 exactly envisaged for? Uh, so it's a stepwise publication because uh, the countries need different parts of the Holas 3 products at different points in order to align the, the work with their national processes and, uh, and national reporting. So uh, the the deadline for publication of the data that underlies the assessment, uh, the indicator results and reports, as well as the thematic assessments is end of March. Uh, so only a few months away. Uh, but then the State of the Baltic Sea report uh, and the dedicated State of the Baltic Sea website, uh, they will come a little later. They are planned for publication uh, in autumn um, this year. Uh, and that's because the State of the Baltic Sea report is essentially a summary report that picks up on the results from the indicator evaluations and from the thematic assessments uh, and pull all of those together to, to kind of give you a, an easily accessible uh, platform to get an overview of all this information. Then you can dive deeper in where you think that this is necessary. But... Uh, in order to do that, we need to have the indicator evaluations and the thematic assessment reports ready and approved so that we know um, what information we can actually build the summary report from. So end of March for uh, the products and then the latest uh, October, but hopefully before that, for uh, the website, uh, official State of the Baltic Sea report. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is officially sort of wrapping up. We're slightly earlier, which I'm sure everyone is is uh, happy about rather than dragging this out. Um, as has been mentioned in the beginning, there will be a recording made available with all the results of the presentations today that will be uploaded on the Blues Project website. And a memo will be shared with all participants of the outcomes of this conference, as well as questions that have been sent in through the chat will be included. So in closing, I just want to say thank you to all the participants. We had 95 to start with. I think we're trickling down now to 45. Uh, thank you for following, for listening, for being active, for asking questions. It's been really great to have that interaction. Uh, I really hope you've enjoyed today's conference and that it has fulfilled your expectations. Um, should you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to turn to the project coordinator, Jana. Uh, for any additional questions you have. And so on behalf of Helcom and the project, uh, the Blues project team, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And it's been an absolute pleasure for my end anyways, to learn about all these activities and uh, the great work that is progressing within the Baltic Sea Action Plan work and Helcom. So uh, everyone have a nice, lovely afternoon and take care.